This episode is about minutes 46 through 50 of The Empire Strikes Back with Ken Plume. Hello there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chris Anthony Tan, feel free to call me Xanthi, and today is all about minutes 46 through 50 of The Empire Strikes Back. We start these minutes on the Falcon, where Han is trying to troubleshoot things, and 3PO realizes that the asteroid they've landed on isn't entirely stable. And then the remaining four minutes of this excerpt take place on Dagobah. It is in these minutes that we finally meet Yoda for the very first time in the entire franchise. And as you know, Yoda has an incredibly distinct design, physicality, and crucially, sound. So I wanted to spend a good amount of time discussing the performance and execution of Yoda, since Yoda's sound greatly contributes to the overall soundtrack of Star Wars. Anyway, for that reason, today's guest is Ken Ken Plume, writer, producer, podcaster, and um, Muppet expert, if you don't mind me calling you. Hello, Ken. I'll I'll let let you describe me as such. It's it's fine. I don't know if it's entirely accurate, (laughs) but I'll let you describe me as such. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, thank you for having me on. I've been... um, uh, you know, I'm I'm one of your many like lurkers on social media. Who, whenever you add to your lengthy Muppet thread, I'm like, wow! Like my appreciation for the Muppets has like really skyrocketed over the last, I guess, year or so. Thanks to your thanks to your tweets and footage that you share. Oh, cheers! What aspect of it has has most increased as far as an appreciation? I think. Well, first of all, I didn't. I didn't know that there was, like, I didn't know that the Muppet show was such a big, was such a big thing. Um, I sort of think about the, I've always thought about the Muppets as just a thing that has already arrived. It's already everywhere. It's already a thing. There's movies, there's Disneyland attractions, there's Muppets are, are, you know, so your tweets and your, the footage that you've shared have kind of um, made me realize more of the origins of the Muppets and, um, crucially like the inclusion of the songs and the sort of duets and the, you know, the, uh, you know, like the singer songwriters that would come on the show and just the way that, I don't know, like watching the Muppets perform songs, like is for some reason something I hadn't, I knew about it, but seeing it, I don't know, it's different. It's like really touching. And I feel like you really highlight the emotional aspect of of the Muppets and how, you know, connecting with each other and, um, I don't know, the heart of them, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, certainly if you have come to it later, uh, it's sort of like, well, how did they get to be just a cultural presence, which they are now? They're just there. They're just just part of the, oh yeah, I recognize there are Muppets about, but there was a time when there was no Muppets. So how did they get to be so worldwide? uh acknowledged and and just just part of that firmament and and base knowledge of pop culture that just seems to permeate i think what touches me the most is um seeing footage of uh, like the singers um singing or you know or like paul williams at the piano um just singing with the muppets and um interacting with them like in a very non-jokey way like it like in a just a very genuine like sincere way that that kind of elevates the Muppets to this like you know it's not just a joke like they're not just like toys or whatever um they really feel um like alive in a way and um I don't know seeing just seeing them all move like I don't know I think of the Muppets as very um I don't know very filled with life um and yeah I mean, that's sort of, you know, the, the magic of puppetry as an art form, which it is, you know, I, I would consider it a form of animation. I mean, it is, it is a creator animating this other, this inanimate object, whether it be, you know, lines on a page or, or this, this puppet, uh, which definitely plays into the scene and the character that we're going to talk about today and how, you know, it, there's a lot of aspects that you can look at this thing and think, oh, that's comical. This this could have not worked. Totally. I, yeah. <laughs> I think that, that <laughs> aspect, just like, what if, just what if Yoda didn't work? That was just like, that's a, such a, a good thing it did work. But 
I can see, and I know that George Lucas initially didn't want Frank Oz, so he says. So, well, even Frank believed it was that the, that George, and it makes sense, would have gone to Jim Henson first, mm. as well. You're going to go straight to the top and ask for the top guy because Frank at that point was just a supporting player, mm-hmm. as far as anyone else was concerned. He's like part of Jim Henson's Muppet performing troupe. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, wasn't wasn't a director at that point. Wasn't known outside of the Muppets. And sure, the Muppet Show was becoming a cultural phenomenon at that point. But uh, you know, there's a very uh, telling statement that Frank gives in a behind the scenes of uh, the Muppet Show special that was done uh, during its final year, where he talks about the anonymity that he sort of has as a puppet performer at that point. And that, you know, it's sort of something that he loves having, uh, but also wants to have more. That's a weird sort of uh, uh, catch-22. It's like, you know, sometimes it's great to be able to go into like a supermarket and buy a can of beans and no one's going to cost you while you're buying a can of beans. Sometimes, though, you want to be noticed when you go in and buy a can of beans because your ego needs to be fed in that way. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, this is, uh, you know, the, the weird sort of position that these performers were in at that point. So, but for Jim, who was swamped as the head of the Muppet organization and trying to get Dark Crystal off the ground and the Muppet movie in process and, and all these things that were going on, for him to go and say, no, no, I'm going to go to Frank. Uh, we'll give Frank a try. Uh, was a big thing. And also for them to do it. You know, and for obvious reasons, as I'm sure we will discuss. Yeah. You know, Frank has a very definite uh, uh, tone and character to his voice yes. that that is noticeable. <laughs> <laughs> we'll certainly and talk about point, that. And at that point, very ingrained in a generation of children that were viewing these films. Yeah, that's a good way to put that. Um, I have some listener questions related to what you what you just mentioned so we will we will definitely cover (laughs) we'll definitely cover that um before we head uh, in before we head too far down uh yoda land let's uh, begin the minutes uh you know the first minute takes place on the falcon um and there's no music so it'll probably we'll probably get by it pretty pretty fast but (laughs) um okay starting it now Well, now we're on the Falcon. We were at the end of Vader's chamber. I'm almost afraid to ask, but does that include shutting me down too? No, I need you to talk to the Falcon, find out what's wrong with the hyperdrive. So that's the Falcon being jostled. It's very obvious. Sir, it's quite possible this asteroid is not entirely stable. Not entirely stable. I'm glad you're here to tell us these things. Joy- Just in the background, do you hear the the whole time, the sort of like hum of the Falcon, the kind of subtle sort of mechanical, yeah. environmental hum. Yeah, I find that very soothing. <laughs> <laughs> we take the professor in the back and plug him into the hyperdrive. <clears throat> Sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. After all, I've only tried to do my job. And there's going to be another big jostle. Oh, please. Don't get excited. Captain, being held by you isn't quite enough to get me excited. Sorry, sweetheart. As ever, as everyone knows, in the next scene, they're going to kiss, so they're pretty close. But an awkward <laughs> moment to lead into that. <laughs> For sure. Okay, well, now, now we're on Dagobah. As we can hear, not only from the music, but all of those creatures, the bats... The random birdie things. Yes, what, we've we've very clearly gone from mechanical to a a much more biological environment. Exactly, teeming with life. Um, what do you have any thoughts about? Um, how do you feel about Dagobah? <laughs> it seems very humid. I'm not a big fan of humidity, and <laughs> that seems like it'd be very humid. Uh, it, 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 yeah, something about the general dampness of the place is not too terribly appealing. I don't think you can get a, a very good uh, uh, structure built 
there. Commuting's probably horrible. Well, it seems Yoda's the only person on there. The only denizen or in, in, yeah, intelligent the only, species, the only, I guess you would. The only, the only one, the only creature who could possibly have a role in any wars. <laughs> in any conflict. There yeah. could be any, any intelligent uh, or uh, uh, conscious conflict. Yeah. Uh, exactly. No, it, yeah, it seems like a, uh, it's a weird place to retire to. <laughs> Another in our long line of, of whole ecosystem, uh, single ecosystem planets. So it's just a small totally. planet. Yeah, it's a, it's a very tiny planet. You can almost see the curve. Um, it seems like it's very sort of uh, treacherous. Like it seems like everything there is somehow going to hurt you, even if it's tripping on a limb. Ah, uh-huh. that's an interesting way to think about it. I, I think of it as, I think from Yoda's point of view, it's a, actually a pretty friendly place. Not friendly, but he, he knows it. I guess, I guess kind of like Luke on Octo, where it could be treacherous for Ray or, you know, untrained Ray, but like Luke knows his way. He, he knows how to pole vault across the ocean, across the rocks. Like he, so Yoda Which is knows. weird because he's cut himself off from the force. So shouldn't he be like super clumsy at that point? Like. Not, you know, mid-50s or 60s gymnast. So- <laughs> I feel like he never completely cut himself off from the force. I feel like his residual skills would still remain. Or he's, you know, still pretty athletic. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> or he's he, just I don't not accepting he, long-distance calls. I don't think he... It, yes. I think he doesn't, like, put out his feelers. But I think, like, the gains that he's gotten from training under the influence of the force, I don't think he loses those. <laughs> um so so yoda this is this is yoda's home at this point and luke and r2 are just are just visitors and the music that we have just started to hear it's a super short cue um it's the cue called yoda yoda appears and it's not you know it's not the full it's not the magical sounding like theme that we end up getting to know and love, it's sort of this um, uncertain, well, let's keep playing. Like I'd say this is more creepy, more- Just a mysterious. Mysterious. Yeah, definitely mysterious. Right as that um, piccolo bassoon line comes in, dee, 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 is coincides with when um, Luke ignites a little fusion furnace, and you know we see like a spark. So I don't know how intentional that sinking was, but it's kind of a it nice. It certainly seems like it's like the, the it seems like the music pumps in just to keep you unsettled. Hmm. Like it's not it's not a soothing theme at all. It's very much what's going to happen. What what is the surprise that this is building towards? Mm. Well, yeah, it's not soothing, um, but it does do a lot of like changing of uh, like the statements that it's making. Like I'll go back a little bit. It's like okay, so. Strings are doing a thing. Now an oboe's doing a thing. What? It's not lasting very long. Okay. Now there's the piccolo bassoon. You're not like humming. The, you're not getting this stuck in your head. I mean, some people are, but. Now all I gotta do is find this right now it's like stalling if he even exists it's pretty much it's accompanying um Luke it's like Luke's sound personal soundtrack at the moment it feels but like. is it do you feel it's reflective of his feelings his sort um, of uh, oh, sort question. of feeling his way through the situation 
Because hmm. it does seem propulsive, but it's uncertain at the same time to me. It does. Like, it's got force behind it, but it's a, like it doesn't seem to know where it's going. Correct. And I don't think Luke knows where he's going. But he's, it, yet he is still propelled by the mission of finding Yoda, but he still has no clue where, he, where he's looking. Even he has when a mission, but he's blind. Him. Well, even when Yoda's right in front of him, he <laughs> keeps searching. He yeah. doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, I kind of, I do wonder how, th- what R2 is sort of saying at this point. Like, we should just leave. <laughs> I don't like this. Or. I mean, R2's got to be the joke, right? He's like, just wait. He's going to pop up. This is great. We, this, <laughs> we planned this a while ago. You're going to love him. I love Yoda. It's been so long since I've seen him. Oh, in fact, he's right, right over there. Hold on a second. <laughs> that's right. He does. They certainly have met. Oh, that's funny. Well, that is a little bit strange to think about in retrospect. Yeah. I, there's no sign yet that Luke actually knows what R2 is saying at this point. Like, I don't know if right. he ever fully learns other than just the you know the emotional gist of what R2 is trying to get across but as far as actual translation into words i don't think he ever fully gets the hang of that other than oh yeah i i feel kind of whiffy about this too R2 yeah kind of like how i talk to my cat i'm like yeah me too anakin yeah um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes although he does have the benefit of translators at many points, whether 3PO or, like, I guess his X-Wing has, like, his screen translates what R2 is saying, I think. This is, like, what a sc- what one of the screenplays said. Um, so maybe he knows a couple of the beeps, but, yeah, for sure. I think he's, you know. But at this point, this seems like it's just a great joke from R2. Just, like, he's like- going to sit back and watch this unfold. That's kind of that's a funny perspective. I, I'm going to go with that for now. Um, <laughs> that makes it makes it a fun read. Um, okay, we will continue. It's really a strange place to find. Okay, I just want to call attention to this. It's doing like a whole tone thing. And I feel like this is, to me, that part sounds um, less of the mysterious, uncertain, and more of the mysterious, but wonderment. Like it, it starts to. It's like a hint of magical thinking right there. Um, Do you feel that's the cue of sort of announcing Yoda's imminent arrival? Perhaps. Like, like um, mag- magic has entered the room. Sort of. Well, he says, now all I got to do is find Yoda, if he even exists. And then the music is sort of almost like saying, he exists. And then getting out of the way. <laughs> and like, it's perhaps enough to, to keep him going. Um, I'm going to go back a little. Okay. So the fire has light, lit, been lit. Now all I gotta do is find this Yoda. If he even exists. It's really a strange place to find a Jedi. Of course, the harp, the celeste, um, helps. Helps there too. The harp, you know, the harp kind of gives the magical moment. Um, makes it feel. Is there a anything bit magical. in that progression that shows up in Yoda's actual theme? Is that pulled in mm-hmm. any way from Yoda's theme? Not directly, but Yoda's theme has um, so okay. So Yoda's theme heavily features something called the Lydian mode, which is um, basically the driving feature in it is a sharp four, which means the fourth the what's normally the fourth note of the scale. So is sharped so it's a sharp four so it's one two three four and so it's and if it weren't a sharp four would be like 
Like it, the Lydian mode is like very intrinsic, is very baked into Yoda's um, Yoda's theme. And here, where it's like, it is kind of also doing a, you know, a, a sharpening of, you know, a sharpening just means raising by a, a half step. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, there is a, something similar to it. It's not like an exact like, oh, that's the part that's quoted in this section. It, but, right. But yeah, there are qualities. Because to my, you know, and, and completely untrained, unstudied. So I'm leaving all of the deep musical knowledge <laughs> to you. I'm not claiming okay. any of it. But as a listener, mm-hmm. to me, it seems like that is leading me on. Mm-hmm. Like it's like a, like a fish hook is in you audibly pulling you towards something. Yes. Is that the intention of that Lydian mode? Is that one of the, or is something that's intrinsic to it? It's not always obviously an intention, but actually um, Frank Lehman, who uh, compile, who maintains this complete catalog of the musical themes of Star Wars, kind of also catalogs the sort of associative progressions. And I guess the, to cut a long story short, this sort of, like Lydian chord progression that we hear in Yoda's theme, dee, 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 dee. Um, where there's like that sharp four note. Um, we also hear it in young Anakin's theme. Dee, 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 dee. And we also hear it in Rose's theme. We also hear it in, I don't know, like a lot of other places where there's some sort of either childlike or, or magical wonderment, sort of magical hope stuff. Also, it, sound, it sounds to me like flying a kite. Have you ever flown a kite? Yes. Because uh, uh, it's a weird thing that is anti intuitive where you have to draw it in to get it to actually catch. And get to a higher height. Like you have to actually mm. reel it back before you, whoop, and it pulls and goes higher. And then you pull it back in and boop, and then it pulls higher. And then you have to keep doing that. But ultimately you're getting up to, you know, it's drawing you further and further into the situation of flying the kite. That's a nice visceral metaphor. Cause I know what you mean. Cause it, you can feel like when you draw it in, you can feel that you're not the one lifting it. You feel like the wind, like, Catches lifting. it like it's yeah. Like, yeah it's like it's like okay it's I'm like ready to irresistibly take over again. buoyant at that point right and I guess yeah I I do associate that with Yoda's theme and with this sort of tonality um, it does feel like it's just going to rise you know it's it's so optimistic and <laughs> um, yeah and I think lead, what you said of where it sounds like it's leading you on that also that's a very good way to describe it because. Um, well, like this, the whole tone scale alone. The nature of the scale is that each note is a whole tone apart rather than like a, tor- like a normal scale that we think about, like a major scale, is a combination of whole steps and half steps. So it sounds more like there's a beginning and end. Whole tone would be... So it actually it has no it, there's no end to the whole tone scale because it's there's no tug there's no tug that's there that sort of yanks you yeah and you sort um, of instead it sounds like you're just sort of bobbing along it leads you along it can lead you on forever and it's actually used in many film scores especially on the harp um, <laughs> where, it, where it's it's you know like a musical trope at this point to do like a harp kind of ascending in a whole tone scale like going into a dream or something. So, um, yeah. I mean, now I'm making the association of this whole lifting of that, which is the big part of Yoda's training. You got the lifting of the rocks. <laughs> Very true. You got the lifting of the X-Wing. So I wonder if, you know, this is, I guess, one of those cart and horse chicken and egg situations when it comes to film composition. You know, is this Williams responding to the visuals of what Yoda is going to teach Luke and do, you know, when he finally sees the film before him and actually gets to the composition stage. Like, Oh, okay. He's going to do some lifting. What, what musically (laughs) can I do that denotes that he's a character who's going to teach, you know, Luke to lift magically with the force. 
what yeah, represents that? Um, yeah, the question you posed of like, you know, it's a, a chicken and egg. That's that's all I can say is like, well, he probably <laughs> already had, a, he was already, you know, John Williams, who is very well versed in, in music, um, incredibly, um, he would already have associations based on the music he already has studied and, and listened to. And at the same time, he, you know, is writing what he thinks the scene and the character needs but I guess matching the two things together, um, I don't know, you know, there's his own creativity and then there's also his own, his associations, um, with the music he already knows that, yeah. Good stuff. Thanks for, uh, <laughs> thanks for making, uh, yeah. Thanks for interrogating that further. <laughs> it's always helpful. All right. I'm going to keep playing. I master. This place gives me the creeps. Still. Now, what do we hear? Something familiar about this place. The, the forest theme that's yep. in the background? I don't know. Yep. It's brief. It's just a little hint of it. But that's what this key was doing. It's giving, it's giving mystery with a couple hints of like, wait. <laughs> and it's just like, a little... Like, Luke, will you listen already? Do you just... Chill out. <laughs> yeah. Another chicken and egg situation where it's like, Luke, just trust your instincts. Just feel the force. But also, he's so poorly trained at this point. So I guess that's what he's here to do. He just needs to, he just needs to get his you know, act together a little bit more to, to at least get to the teacher. Um, I believe in you, Luke. Uh, let's do this. <laughs> oh, now, now I'm curious on a rewatch, now that you say that, that... Mm -hmm. I'm wondering at what point, and if there is a point in the three films, where, I mean, I would assume it'd be in Jedi, where the Force theme is queued up because of Luke, not to cue Luke. Mm. Like, at what point does Luke actually represent the Force theme as opposed to, like, the Force theme tapping on his shoulder going, hey, I'm here, use me. That's a... That's an interesting question because I want to say it probably has already happened or it probably happens a lot. But then I think, well, the force theme was originally Ben's theme. And, but at the same time, Ben does also represent the force. He's the first force person that Luke meets. And it makes sense that Ben's theme would be adopted, you know, as the catch all force theme. But. Luke also has his own theme, which is the main theme. Uh, I guess I'll have to keep thinking about that. So where have we heard? So, so far in the film, in Empire, mm -hmm. is the first time we hear the Force theme when he's in the Wampa Cave? I think so. And I was just going to say that may be, it, that may count as a time. Because he's like, you know, getting his lightsaber. Um and we do hear the force theme, so I guess that would that count for what you're what you're for asking? him actually, yeah, being in a a, a Zen place of accessing least, it, and like I feel like there he's calling on the force to grab his lightsaber. But that's also him having to actively, like, is there any point where his arrival? comes with the force theme like the force theme uh. represents his arrival as opposed to i'm using the force now now i'm trying to tap into that thing mm. i'm having to yank the force into this whereas hey i'm just luke skywalker i'm the force now oh interesting like like he, he becomes it i forgot what that like yeah like that becomes called, his but like that becoming his theme yeah or part of his theme like he's now i'm one with the force i'm not just you know desperately reaching out for it in I a want moment of trouble and hoping it responds. I want which to it say, barely does in the Wampa Cave. <laughs> but it does just enough. Um, but I, I want to say probably not as much. Uh, I, I, I think no, but I think yes, because saying no is probably means I missed a spot. But I think overall, because when I think of like Luke showing up, I, I hear in my head more 
the rebel fanfare, the main theme, something heroic, not something like, oh, the force has arrived. Um, unless, I don't know, maybe in the sequels. Maybe in the sequels. Yeah, I now feel I'm like wondering if maybe it's not until the sequels that that maybe. actually becomes... And I think, Just like, out and out representative of Luke. And I think uh, the Wampa Cave, when we see him using, like, channeling the Force, and we see the Force theme creep up, and I, I feel like that. I feel like it's sort of separate from Luke. It's not like Luke has arrived; the Force theme has shown up, showed up, because I, he it still requires more effort. You know, the connection between um, using the Force and being able to do the thing is it's still a, a long. You know, it, there's still kind of a long path that it has to follow, sort of like learning a language and, you know, being kind of slow to translate. You kind of still have to do a whole thing in your head first before, yeah, you know, Yeah, it's like saying. you don't quite have the syntax right yeah. yet. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, me need bathroom. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. and it's a lot like uh, like learning an instrument, too. Like, you, you learn something new, and then you're kind of really thinking about it. You're kind of having to do it slowly, and then... You know, when you're more advanced or you've practiced a lot, you can just pick up your instrument and start playing the thing. You don't have to like think, okay, I, I put this on my shoulder first and then like, oh, I forgot I have to do this with my pinky, like which is how it can be at the beginning. So right. I think so Luke I'm, is still you know, on the stage. So he's, he has to summon the force theme still yeah. at this yeah. page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's like, okay, relax my mind. Okay, close my eyes. See okay. if the orchestra will respond. See, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. The orchestra doesn't lie. So, um, yeah. Okay, let's continue. I feel like... Like we're being watched. Oh, wait, but you... It's such an aggressive way for Luke to start. Like we're... Yeah. He's immediately defensive or, or offensive or whatever. So that's the first Yoda line in I mean, all the, of Star Wars. The music has been making him completely unsettled. <laughs> For so, sure. <laughs> so he's very touchy at this point. <laughs> yeah. So let's 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 go back a little bit more for maximum effect. We can. Something familiar about this place. I don't know. I feel like. <laughs> so trivia people. If you're asked what is the first line that Yoda says, it's feel like what? So take notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think of this cold open right here? I mean, you know, talking about the sort of vocal performance mm -hmm. of Yoda, this is, this whole scene is the most extreme and I would say cartoony. You know, if you were to think a comical performance, this is the most out there it gets. Like this is this is the most out there his performance as Yoda ever gets. In any of the prequels included. This is well, the Well, he's most very serious in the prequels, so certainly the prequels. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean this is so this is the only time we see this side of even in you know, even Last in the rest of Empire or the rest of Jedi, even when he's you know, uh, uh uh, scolding Luke later mm -hmm. in the the teaching, you know it's it's not as as comical and broad a performance mm. as it is in this introduction here. So I don't know if this was because everything's filmed out of sequence. We have no idea. You know, we we obviously look at shooting schedules and see where this was shot in production. How much of this is ADR as well? So this could have been chosen way later as far as what this was. Maybe as a way of disarming the audience. Like you go with the broad first. So when you dial it back, people are really drawn in to this performance of Yoda and are thinking of it more as a character than a, a Muppet, than Frank Oz's Muppet voices. Because you've gotten that out of the way. Now everything is toned down and dialed back after this. I've heard that he that Frank Oz didn't completely nail down the voice until like post production or until ADR or something. Um, oh yeah, if you hear the onset stuff, it's have you and heard the, it? the deliveries are very weird. Uh, have you heard it? 
Yeah, if there's some documentaries out there, there's one unreleased documentary too that has some footage of some of the takes of him. Oh, I really uh, want to hear that. I want to see that. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to okay, you. Uh, cool. It, uh, and you can hear him sort of getting that, and it, and I think knowing that it's basically scratch tracks that they're doing anyway, because mm-hmm. I think he knew that it's going to be eighty yard at that point. That it was just, hey, let's get the beats and mm-hmm. the placeholder of the dialogue in here, and I can work of what the inflection which means that this was an adr then chosen delivery to be this broad at the beginning so when you say broad you mean like here you feel like he's showing more range than he eventually does when he's dialed into his character yes so this is more than oh you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) that the wild and wacky you know old man crazy old man yoda that we find in the swamp then it becomes well, do you think Yoda is putting it on on purpose for Luke? I mean, he kind of has I do. to be at yeah. this point. I mean, you don't dial it back as far as he does and never go back to this. Like, he, it never gets wacky like this again. Yeah. I feel like you the know, moment he changed, I feel like the moment his entire countenance changes is, I, I guess, in about 10 minutes when Yoda is going, when Luke is talking to him and he, he doesn't say, like, oh, I'm Yoda. It's when he starts talking to Ben. He's like, that's when his whole, he becomes serious. And like, this feels like a test. This is the yeah, first test. And totally. I would think Luke failed it. First he did, thing, he reaches he for his blaster. He dismisses him. He doesn't want to listen to him. He doesn't care what he has to say. He sees him as a nuisance. He's not, he's not willing to engage with him at all. R2's over there loving all of this. <laughs> He really is. <laughs> I mean, you know, at that point, I, I love the fact that he has a tug of war with him I, too. Yeah. So no, I I think it, I would if Yoda is going to go in and test who Luke is as a person at this point. This is a great test to see how he reacts in a given situation, and it's not not too good. Yep. Yeah, agreed. Um. Yes. Okay. So now, now the real Yoda stuff is is going to continue, and actually, the queue that had pretty much just started um, is already ending, and there's not going to be any more music for the next two, almost two and a half minutes, <laughs> because I, I really hear, I don't know, just Yoda is the, kind of the star of this, and R two. Um, it's funny. <laughs> it's really funny. Uh, <laughs> So here we'll continue listening to Yoda. Just slapstick it up. One on, yeah. Like we're being watched. Oh, hey, but you have I mean you no know, harm. I am wondering, why are you here? I'm looking for someone. Wink, wink. Looking? Found someone you have, I would say. <laughs> right. Already, um, he's done a few signature. I guess, signature vocal things. Um, (laughs) Like he doesn't always do them to that extreme, but he has that laugh in him. Like he has it in him. Um, That sort of grunt, the, the sort of hmm thing. Yeah. And that hmm. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Someone on Twitter, I think it was John said that they always hear Grover at that point. Yeah, because Grover's all a deeper Frank Oz voice. Mm. Like, it's it's more in the chest as far as his voices. Like, you know, Animal is more shouty, yelly, scratchy, whereas, you know, Grover goes down into, the, you know, much lower. Him pushing it into his chest is where Grover's enthusiasm is coming out of. So low Grover is kind of like Yoda? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah, because okay. I think it, it's that sort of chesty sound that, mm, you know, mm. in the back of the throat, pulling out of of the chest. Uh, yeah. Whereas, you know, animal is, animal's like at the top of the mouth. Animal's like more noise, the noise to pitch ratio of, like, animal has more noise and Grover has a little, has more pitch. 
animal feels like glottal, like uh, like a uh, uh, like really engaging the sinuses and, yes. <laughs> and the back, and the, 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 the very raspy. Clear in his throat at all. Whereas Grover is <clears throat> like a rumble. There's a rumble mm. to Grover that is. I, yeah, I definitely would push Yoda into the Grover side. Then sure. you know, and Piggy sort of exists in the middle of those, and obviously is trying for a higher registered as a female character is what he's pushing that into. Uh, but I would put Piggy more to the side of Grover than uh, that animal side as yeah. well. Well, yeah, in the grand scheme of Frank Oz's character voices, well, first of all, I, I have some clips pulled up of some of his other voices. So I'm going to play a Grover, Grover clip. Buenos noches, senor, and welcome to La Casa de Comidas. That means the house of foods in Spanish. Oh, very nice. Muy so I'm definitely hearing, definitely hearing the Yoda, uh, like... Bueno. Actually, I am not Spanish myself, but I have learned a lot of cute little Spanish words from my good friend Luis. I... It's more high-pitched there, though. There's less gravel in that clip. Yes. Uh, cause he's, you know, he's also playing, I think Grover's supposed to be like a 10 year old, uh, oh, is he? enthusiasm that sort of, mm. oh my gosh, I'm so excited kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah. And like, I don't know if you have Bert in the clips as well. Bert is just like straight up nasal Frank Oz. Oh, I will pull up Bert. Like it doesn't have that, that sort of phlegmy rumble to it. Here. While I pull that up, um, this is a question from someone. Where do the Muppets end and Sesame Street begin? Are Sesame Street Con characters contractually? Muppets? <laughs> oh, Legally, okay. where do they end? <laughs> uh, traditionally, they, they are Muppets. What do you mean traditionally? You know, I mean, that's now a, a legal term for what is owned and not owned by the Disney company. So, Oh. Uh, you know, at this point, I think they are, I think they're like, they're called the Sesame Street Muppets, I think is like the official legal term they That's can funny. use for them. But yeah, traditionally they were just, they were Muppets the same as they were, they were the Sesame Street Muppets. Then you have like the, the Muppet Show Muppets and the Fraggle Rock Muppets, basically any of the sort of, uh, those creations, uh, for the Jim Henson company were sort of broadly under the whole Muppet tent. Okay, so Sesame Street characters are basically Muppets, so I, then. So I would say yes, they are. They are definitely Muppets. In fact, the 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 base form uh, for most of the Sesame Street Muppets was called an anything Muppet. That's the one oh, really? where you you'd, you'd put different hair on it and different eyes, and you know it would become six different characters. <gasps> like if you look if you look at you know break down the count, break down uh, you know all of those characters, and you'll notice that the base bodies are the same. It's just it's eyes and Mouths, uh, you know, you know, not mouths, but uh, eyes and hair and that that changes. Oh but wow! The base form is is sort of just this, almost you either have like a uh, almost triangular shape to some of them, and some of them are just the round shape, and it's just the elements on them that creates the character. So they the base form would be an anything muppet. Oh, I like that. <laughs> that's that's cool. Okay, so here's um, Bert. To the little dance. Oh, wait, let's find a clip without music. <laughs> My bottle cap collection. Oh, Ernie, your, look your at them all. Bottle, Aren't they beautiful? Bottle cap? My bottle cap Let collection. See. You want to take a look? Yeah, oh, the... be careful. Your hand's clean. Ah, oh, gee, Ernie. And now we're on this lake and not one bite. Mm -hmm. Where are all the fishes? Well, they're down there, Bert. They are. Sure. If you'd like, I'll catch some and show you. Are you is Ernie Jim Henson? Yes. Classic double act. Yeah. That's why you also get Kermit and Piggy and Kermit and Fozzie and yeah, Henson and, and Oz were the main double act of the, the classic Muppets. So what was the comparison you were making with Bert? He sounds so more Bert, nasal. Bert more nasal. Like yes. there's no no rumble to mm. Bert. You know, Bert's just all, all high up in the hey, you know, Ernie. Yeah, you know, it's all upper, upper mouth. Uh, you know, all that the whole sinuses thing. Yeah. As opposed to any of the throatiness of Grover. 
mm. or the raspiness of animal. Yes. Uh, um, and then if you take Bert to sort of an extreme, you sort of get fuzzy. Okay, I have a fuzzy clip. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to pull a rabbit out of this hat. One, two, three, presto! Shalom. Right, go, 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 sir. I just booked this person on an 803. Oh, he could get 20 years for that. Yes, sir. What's an 803? Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Now that I'm hearing Bert and then Fozzie. Yeah. Yeah, you put a little bit of an accent on it, like a D's and those. But yeah, that's, it's just, just, you know, it's, it's more, it's Bert with a lot more emotion. You meet Fozzie, you feel has more. Fozzie is. He puts Fozzie more emotion. Is, yeah. sort of, it feels like there's more weight yeah, he's like, to Fozzie. To yeah, because he's performing. Yeah, yeah. Fozzie's always in performance mode, you know. Canonically, as a, as yes, correct. a struggling correct. comic. Who's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you know, he's always going broad, you know, that's the way to think of Fozzie, whereas Bert is very, you know, <laughs> very within himself and. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a very very uh, 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 buttoned up nature to Bert. Yes, that is not and also a frustrated positive. nature, which I feel like can push the nasalness because he's sort of always yes not shouting, but I don't know, he's saying something in a certain he's tone. Always disappointed. He's always, yeah. just perpetually disappointed and annoyed and and frustrated by the antics of Ernie. So it's it's always a oh Ernie, why do you have oh why are you making my life so hard? Yeah, because well, it's fun, Bert. You know that kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the the for me the closest analog is Miss Piggy, and I I always heard that as a as a kid, and I I think in this clip maybe even more so, and I think it might be because of how expressive Miss Piggy is. Like, Miss Piggy has such a range, so it... Well, I'm at, I'll play a clip. Very good! Now for a third trick! <laughs> yes! I'm going to ask Fufu to solve a difficult mathematical problem. Fufu, what is two plus two? Woo! 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 somewhere for the night uh, and have a quiet little dinner for two terrific i'll eat with you miss piggy wait who's gonzo that's dave goals okay okay so miss piggy here obviously sounds more high-pitched than yoda but if you if listeners are familiar with miss piggy we she also goes to very like when she's frustrated she goes to she gets gravel in her voice as well yes or when uh, she's, you know, doing a karate chop. Ah, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Then she'll get that. But that's going down, for me, into that Grover rumble. Yes. So, but, it's, but it's only when Piggy goes into those lows. Of, yeah, that's true. You know, her action mode or her, her anger mode. Whereas yeah. the baseline of Piggy is that sort of much cleaner voice to me mm -hmm. of that, that higher pitch nasal thing that Frank does. Yeah, that's, that's true. Although Piggy has so much range, gives, yeah. gives her so much range. Uh. But but Yoda never goes into like I I I'm now I'm thinking about it. Do we? I don't think we ever hear Yoda go into a clean voice that doesn't mm. have that doesn't have some the gravel that in it. rumble. Yeah, the rumble. Yeah, that's a good point because he goes high, but even on, even when he's sort of like well, like when he's gonna be f fighting over the stick, there still is the rumble. I'm pretty sure. So. Or even when he, you know, topples over when all the rocks collapse and they're doing the balancing thing. He's like, wah! And it falls. Mm. He, has, he has the grit to it. It's not like a wah! kind of thing in a higher pitch. Yeah. Cleaner thing. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're that's certainly true. Um, just for th thoroughness' sake, where would you place Sam Eagle and Cookie Monster in this? I would say it's... Bottom of the throat without the phlegm. Cookie Monster? Cookie, no, Cookie Monster, I think, is, is the <sighs> bottom of the throat, but the raspiness of animal. Yeah. So it's very much down here, but it's got yeah. some rasp to it. 
Uh, whereas totally. Sam Eagle is very clean at the you know the bottom of the. It's throat. like the lower version of Miss Piggy's clean high. Yes. Yes, and doesn't have the because Grover has that phlegm. Like it feels like there's congestion in Grover. Yeah, that's, that's like true. just clear your throat, Grover. Just just and try, Cookie just Monster throw. has c- cookies stuck in his throat. He has like crumbs in there. Yeah, they're lodged like, in like there. also one good cough. Like, me, yeah, me, me talk fine now. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that would be funny. Um, that would be a funny like episode where he goes to the doctor, gets his like throat checked out, gets the cookies out of there. <laughs> and also, a lot of that is pulled off in in same way with Yoda, character wise. The voices can maybe be very, very similar, but syntax, mm. like how the sentences are constructed and the lines define the character. So you can have maybe essentially the same voice, but it's the way how iconic. Cookie Monster speaks that carries a lot of weight towards you not thinking of those other characters when he's doing a Cookie Monster voice. Yeah, that's true. It's like, oh no, that's just Cookie Monster because you know me you like want cookies. Cookie. That's, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, those are good points because they all. Because they, I mean, I guess Frank Oz is one person, and even though the characters all kind of, I guess, sound like him to an extent, some more than others are more similar. Uh, I guess he has a lot of parameters he can tweak to um, make each of his characters sort of an individual. Like, okay, I'll do my same baseline voice for these two, but different syntax or like more grumble in one of them. Where this one has like a Jersey accent or, you know, this one has a Brooklyn accent or, you know, this one, this one has a country accent. Who has a Jersey accent? Well, uh, you know, I think there's there's <laughs> Fo- Fozzie is definitely northeast. There's that there's a, new, a northeast sensibility to Fozzie's delivery, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of why. Well, and he does a lot of because there's a lot of anything Muppet characters that he does on Sesame Street that'll pop up. Mm. Like you, you know, you go back and watch any of the sort of uh, who are the people in your neighborhood clips. When he'd show up as the mailman or the fireman and see what voices he would put on to denote, you know, a, a, a Brooklyn mailman. Ah, uh, okay. I need to find Sesame Street to watch now. Does, does Disney own that too? Disney does not. That is okay. uh, now Sesame Workshop, what used to be Children's Television Workshop. Okay. has control okay. of all of the Sesame Muppets and, okay. and the series. Right. That's hence the distinguished name. The distinguished yes. name. Um, okay. Well, actually... I'm going to skip to a listener question. This is from Alex on Discord. Do you think ac- Yoda is an accent? Uh, as far as are we talking about the, the syntax or just the way he's delivering the lines? I think just the way he's delivering the lines. Well, we now have canonically, we've, we've heard Yaddle speak, who's from the same species, and she does not speak in the same syntax. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there could be different regions of whatever their home planet is that that speak in different ways. Yeah. It could just be an affectation. Who knows? Maybe he decided, you know, when he was around 300 to suddenly, like, I'm, uh, I'm going to pick a weird way to talk that people that'll get me noticed. <laughs> this will well, be my thing now. Frank Oz's explanation, like, back in the day was that Yoda speaks, like, that he thinks that's how the original Jedi, like, that's how the original Jedi spoke. And so Yoda's, like, doing more of a throwback to, like, the way that the original Jedi spoke. But that is sort of like, um, that that's, a perf- you know, that's not necessarily in the encyclopedia of Star Wars, whatever. That's sort of like, um, you know, his, as a performer, that's his, that was his source of motivation. Um, right. For that. But now you got me thinking, because I just, I was watching, uh, uh, I found the uh, Mr. Rogers Christmas special from Are those Muppets? Seventy-seven. No. Uh, they're not. Well, he has puppets on it, though. There are uh, puppets in the land of make believe. Puppets, but not Muppets. But what got me thinking when you were mentioning, as far as adopting a way of speech, is that canonically Yoda, and in this, as he's introduced, Yoda is a teacher, mm. and you listen to Fred Rogers talk. And you would not consider that a normal mode of speech, a normal way of speaking. You know, it's very measured. How, you know, Mr. Rogers is very much talking to, you know, young children and 
we're going to talk about this today, boys and girls. Mm-hmm. That's an affected, an affected way of speaking to be able to teach children. And if Yoda is an instructor, you certainly pay more attention to what Yoda is saying because of the way he's saying it. You're paying more attention to his words than rather just dismissing it out of hand because it is something familiar to, familiar to you. So I'm wondering if that was, you know, and this is all just, obviously we're inserting this because this is, I'm sure none of it's worked out, but as a way of making sense, sure, as an instructor and you're dealing with younglings all the time and you want to get their attention, this just may be the mode of speech that he developed as a way to get them to pay attention. That's not like all the other Jedi talking to them the rest of the day. That's such a good point. Um, yeah, he says, so he says fewer words, but it almost like, I don't know, it sounds like he is speaking parables all the time, or like he, it's very quotable. And I can see how a lot of these phrases and ways of saying things have been just taught, I mean, obviously taught to centuries um, worth of Jedi, centuries worth of younglings. Um, but yeah. he also st- tends to start with with action words. Mm, mm-hmm. Like, listen, you will, mm-hmm. as a way of saying. So what is the emphasis on? The first thing he's telling you is the thing to pay attention to. Yeah. As far as an instruction. Yeah. These are good you know, points. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Yoda, the ped- pedagogue. Um well, now you got me. Now you got me deep thinking. Now I'm all just <laughs> thinking is that Yoda is the Mister Rogers of Star Wars. The, I've never made that connection, and I, now I really like that connection. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. um, because you're right, Mister Rogers doesn't speak in like Mister Rogers speaks in a. I'm a, I'm Mister Rogers. You know, I'm do, show, I'm teaching kids. You know, all over America. A very, I mean, back to the musical aspect. A very sing songy way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of speaking, and it gets your attention. Totally. Like if, like if you were to take a Yoda line, like any of the Yoda lines here, because you're much more talented than I am, and also musical. If you were to translate them into music, what is the musicality of Yoda's speech patterns? That's a good question. I mean, without doing a specific transcription, I would say that his vocal. I, I would say that if you were to map the like pitches of his speech, I, I'd say that there's probably much more variation um, than perhaps the average character who might kind of stay in their own tone and kind of sometimes go a little bit above, sometimes go a little bit below. But I, I would think that Yoda's would look more like music, so to speak. Like if even like, you know, and even like lines, the way that he know, starts the- and stops, like there would be like a more of a rhythm to it as well. Like, like, you know, iconic lines for Yoda being like, do or do not. Mm-hmm. There is no try. Like, what is, if you're viewing that and listening to it, how would you think, like, what does that look like to you musically? Well, the rhythm stands out to me most in that, actually. Because um, it would be like, do or do not. There is no, tr-. like, it's more poet. It's, it would be it almost like metered poetry. Um you know, do or do not, there is no try, you know, it's like even syllables. Um, and I guess it would depend on the, I don't know the exact like pitches it would be, but, um, right. But it's sort of bum, 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 bum. Like if that, yeah. what, but it is sort of like, we were talking about his theme leading you on, does the musicality of his delivery of the lines also lead you on? Oh, I can't answer. That would have to be, there's no, you know, one answer to that. <laughs> Does it for you? Does it for anyone else? Yeah. The, that's, that's where just listener interpretation is all that is the only answer there. Um, now we're going to be super listening to these lines coming up in these two minutes of no music. <laughs> I know. Up. Listeners thought you're getting no music here, but now you're just going <laughs> to have Yoda speak stuff listen, in your listen head. Listen to like, the, oh. the beat poetry. Yes. Of Yoda, <laughs> the Mr. Rogers of Star Wars. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's really funny. Um, okay. Did we okay. answer the question? I forgot what the question was. It was, we... is Yoda, and do you think Yoda is an accent? So. Yeah, I, so if, if an accent is something retained as a, a 
piece of personality, certainly, I think. But I think there's, I would more say it's an affectation. I, mm -hmm. I'm leaning towards affectation mm. more than accent. So there you have it. That's Ken's temporary answer. Um, yeah, and completely non-canonical <laughs> and not definitive in any way. So it's fashion or uh, form. Okay, let's continue listening. Help you again? Yes. Mmm. Mm. It's a nice little. Uh, there's a nice little like pitch, uh, ascending pitch thing. Mmm. Uh, now I'm just hearing it everywhere. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm looking for a great warrior. Oh! <laughs> great warrior. I mean, even if you just compare Luke versus Yoda, Luke, he's more monotone, relatively speaking. <laughs> Wars not make one great. <laughs> <laughs> Put that down. Now we. Hey! It's my dinner. So, something that sticks out to me about Yoda here is so much of his, his grunts, his grunts, his like, his sounds that are not just speaking. I kind of, I don't know, I wonder what it would be like to be on set or, you know, to be Frank Oz thinking of like what actions deserve accompanying sounds because not every character like makes sounds of effort when they're walking or lifting things up or you know pulling something but i think at that point if i'm remembering the sort of backstory that he was told at that point i you know I, that yoda was like at that point considered 400 years old i think is what frank was told so He's a very old character. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe one of the interpretations was, yeah, it, it, you're going to verbalize the effort of doing physical things if you're that old moving around. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have, at this point, the, the much more limber and active prequel version of Yoda to reference. So this is now, you're 400 years old. You're, you're this, you know, this... This uh, long-lived, uh, you know, uh, mystical creature living here alone as a hermit here. You know, what, what are you going to do? What is your physical, your uh, vocalization of the physicality to try and impart the age of this character? So you'll see, you know, a lot of the stooped walking, like all that stuff is choices by Frank, you know, obviously in conversation with Irvin Kirshner directing and such, but how are you going to animate this inanimate object to get across that these are the aspects of the character that are supposed to be baked in, that he's very old, that he's very learned, that, you know, you know that there's a personality here, that there, that it is an animate object. You know, that's the thing that in, in puppeteering, it's difficult to, you know, uh, to remember to keep it alive. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people will have a thing, you know, and forget that you it's mean, there. Like in puppetry, and just keep... in puppetry yeah, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, but, you know, brilliant puppeteers, when you see them, you never doubt for a moment, even when they're talking, they're still doing some kind of action with the puppet. Even if they're not in frame, they're just holding it up and they're doing that on set or in front of an audience they're always doing something to keep it alive, whether it's looking over to the side, looking over this way, looking that way, you know, doing a little beat that a human being would do. Mm. That, you know, that because it's not going to blink, you know, unless it has, unless it's, you know, has animatronics connected to it. You know, your standard puppet is not going to blink. It's not going to, it's not breathing. It's not having the little nuances that we notice in other living creatures. So the puppeteer is having to, through performance, manufacture those nuances to where you buy that this is an animate creature. Yeah, that's a, remember to keep it alive. I'm writing that down. I feel like that's a secret to puppet, puppeteering <laughs> <laughs> when I switch careers. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it's yeah, never that's... too late. <laughs> 
<laughs> even just to have a puppet, just have a puppet. Just. I mean, now that you fun. mention it, like even just like if I, when I've, you know, joking around with like a puppet or, or a sock or something, the, the hardest thing that's up that makes it obvious that I'm a total amateur, um, is sort of just like letting it go when I, when it's not talking, you know, when I'm taking over. Yeah. But, or it starts to drift. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's something I was. I'm moving uh, it. I was told, and I, and I am in no way saying that I am good at any of this. <laughs> there are brilliant folks that I can point you to that are, including actual uh, Muppet performers, that that this is like you know second. You know, this is them breathing. It just comes to them because they're that skilled. But you know, one of the things is you know maintaining eye contact, and the fact is like if you consider this like a human head. A human head doesn't flap back oh, when it talks. Yeah. A human head is going to maintain, you know, looking because, you know, this part stays stable. It's the mouth that moves down below. Yeah, that's a good point. So, you know, a lot of people you go <laughs> just go like flap, that yeah. when they're doing a yeah, puppet. In <laughs> fact, so I, 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 did, I did have a puppet. If you want to, I can pull a pu- puppet out yes, real quick please. if you want to see. Yes. <laughs> uh, so. <gasps> Cool. So if I can try and frame it, so yeah, try and maintain with the thing. And again, I'm not the best at this, but so the thing we were talking about, so trying to maintain an eye contact into the camera while he's talking. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, hi, how you doing? Um, keep it animate a little bit here. Keep a little action here. Keep it moving around, looking around like I could be talking to you, but I want to make sure that he's doing something and, you know, maybe commenting on what I was saying, looking around, but just. Keep it animate. But He's so if you don't, cute. <laughs> then it's just, you can tell, let's say if I went like that, like if I'm just talking, then if it's doing nothing, then it just sort of <laughs> dies on your arm. Yeah. And you, you don't want it. You want, you don't you want, want him it to, to die on your arm. Even if he's just, you know, swallowing or <laughs> anything you want to do. And this is just a, basically a sock puppet. Uh, shout out to... Uh, Brilliant uh, puppet uh, uh, builder, uh, James Voitall, who did this for me. Oh, my gosh. But look how simple this is. I mean, this is all Kermit is. All Kermit is is a sock puppet. Mm. Yeah, there's no, it's not blinking. It's not. So, uh, and you got to think Frank, that's all. Frank's performance is, is, you know, you have animatronics that are operating the eyes Mm -hmm. for Frank. Frank's performance is going to be all of the physicality of like, you know, here's Yoda slowly making his way into a frame. Mm -hmm. He's not walking. He doesn't have, he doesn't, he doesn't have feet that are actually moving or legs that are moving. It's Frank having to determine what, what gives weight to something that is weightless. I mean, this is on my arm this is on you know yoda's on frank's arm what feels like it's connected to the earth Mm. as he's going so it's magic of that performance or any puppet performance like that so watch yoda and think about okay they're on an elevated set because frank is underneath the set Mm -hmm. holding his arm above his head for extended periods of time to get it to where he's not seen uh-huh. in the frame. And he's having to make all those calculations. He's watching a little monitor. So he's seeing playback of what the camera is seeing as he's performing. Reversed. Mm-hmm. So mentally he has to do those gymnastics too. But he's having to dial in that performance to play to the camera, to play to Mark Hamill, to be present in the scene. To actually then vocalize the character, even you know, even if he's doing ADR, he's still doing it on set because mm-hmm. he's in a scene with Mark Hamill. He's an actor in the scene. You know, it may be the on the end of his arm, but he's still Frank Oz is an actor in that scene. Absolutely. And to do all of those bits, and also coordinating with you know, there's that's not a light puppet. That's you know not just wearing a sock. Oh, I, I would think it's got to be at least maybe 10 to 15 pounds. Cause that's like foam latex. It's got animatronics. It's got a hard head to hold those eye animatronics and ear animatronics in it. 
I can't imagine that that is a light puppet. Yeah, me neither. In any way. So, and you think about, you know, just think about how long you can hold your arm above your head. <laughs> and then have to, to act with it. But then that's, but that's a symphony. You know, a, a character like Yoda is a performance of all these different elements of the operator for the eyes, the operator for the ears. You know, Frank in there with the physicality and, and Frank actually is doing the mouth for it. So that'll be what Frank will be doing within there. Obviously all of the other movements, but all of that has to be coordinated. Look at that. Just, you know, just a couple of seconds of all the things that are going on with Yoda as a character and how coordinated it has to be, but how it all makes it feel alive. Mm-hmm. And the sound is a big part of uh, making, of selling it. If the sound is not coordinated, that's kind of one of those immediate things that uh, takes you out of it as a as a viewer. Oh, oh, and 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 you know, puppet sync. There's nothing like seeing bad puppet sync. I mean, I, I doing enough audio editing over the years with video, you it just even something slightly out of sync just drives me bonkers seeing it. So, you know, and I'll notice, so if you, uh, you know, not really coordinated with what's being said, you know, a lot of people don't even Do you often see attention. puppet sync go wrong, like in mo movies and stuff? Movies? No, and no, no. Because well, you're seeing mostly professional. It's, oh, okay. it's, it's, it's the non-professional productions. So you can tell. Or unseasoned yeah. puppeteers when they're just going like this yeah. and just flapping and not bothering to think, oh, well, if I'm going to say this, then this is going to move like this and this is going to mm. push. And again, I'm not great at it, but you know, the things I look for, like, uh, it might even have been Dave, maybe. Uh, but, you know, one of the things is pushing out the words. So think about when you're talking, the act of using, uh, you know, of puppeteering it is consider you're pushing all the words out of the mouth, mm -hmm. which is the same, you know, you're pushing air out of your mouth to talk. That's how you're communicating sound. So, so yeah. syncing that up with the performance. Right. Cause like for expressive purposes, you could say things out of different spots of your mouth, like kind of change the shape of your mouth to make things sound different. So I guess if you were doing like, if you weren't matching that up to the, to the puppet, it would sort of be like, well, you're not making and, a round mouth with, you know, yeah. And watch, you know, there's stuff where, you know, Fozzie will do asides to Kermit. And in the, the performance, in the puppeteering, there will be an attempt to approximate, because, again, you know, it's yeah. just a, a big plate that's moving, you know, like that. So, you know, you're not going to get subtlety of movement of a corner of a mouth, but he'll do a little thing with the performance yeah. where it looks like it's coming from the side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so as a, an audience member and, a, you know, a, a human observer... You read it like it's supposed to be read as always. Oh, he's talking out the side of his mouth. You know, there's a lot of people who I think, think that's why they feel like Muppets what, like blank. Real. Yeah, mm. I mean, I think of, you know, a lot of people think Muppets blank. Generally, they don't. It's because yeah, <laughs> I guess it's just because we accept them when they're done well. Yeah, which is the other half of the performance in this scene, which is giving all props to Mark Hamill. Mm. And being in this, and that's, you know, in the Muppet thread you mentioned is talking about the guests that would come on the Muppet show is having someone buy the reality of what's, you know, it's, it's a comp, it's a complimental, I'll say that's a word, uh, but you get the gist, uh, mm -hmm. relationship in that scene. You know, you need those aspects. You can't have someone who doesn't buy into the sincerity of it being there. Mm -hmm. Someone who's dismissive of it. You know, there's no moments that Mark Hamill feels that this puppet is beneath him as a performer. That's a good point. Way to bring it back to like the very first thing that, that I, that I said. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like all, just like those singer songwriters performing really genuinely with the Muppets. Um, Mark Hamill is doing that. Yeah. yeah and you can, t and it, you know, and it, you need that for this little, little green puppet <laughs> you do. To, to exist within that scene. Yeah. 
you know, there's nothing about, even when he's being comedic in the scene, in Yoda's, I mean, this is the most comedic we see Yoda in all of this. I mean, even, even the knuckle wrap, I would put beneath hmm. the, the, the comedic bits of this. You still buy it. You don't look at it as a puppet doing all these things. Because Mark Hamill's genuinely frustrated as Luke Skywalker at this creature who's now interrupting his search for this Jedi Master that he needs to find. Mm-hmm. So you you buy it because Luke Skywalker buys it in that scene. Yeah, that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> so all all kudos also to Mark Hamill. Kudos to Mark for, Hamill for that. Yeah, um, this kind of goes into another question that Alex had, um, which well, first I guess Mike, I'll I'll kind of restate it as partially my question too, which is: Are there ever instances where the puppeteer is doing, where the puppeteer, the, the one person doing the physical puppet performance and the voice are are different people, like Darth Vader? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, cer- certainly. Oh, yes, yes. Um, in fact, Frank has done something like that. Oh, okay. Uh, where Frank was the onset puppeteer, and they later dubbed in a voice. Have you ever seen um, Emmett Otter's Jugman Christmas? What is that? Can you say that name again? Uh, em- Emmett Otter's Jugman Christmas. As as a as a music lover, I very much uh, highly recommend it to you. Okay. I'll it's put a link in the show notes if listeners are interested. 1977. Okay. It was the first musical collaboration with the Muppets and Paul Williams. Oh, nice. Who wrote the songs for it. Mm-hmm. And then they would go on to Rainbow do the Rainbow Connection movie. guy. Yes. Uh, and also, uh, he came back for uh, Muppet Christmas Carol. Oh. And wrote the songs wonderful. for that. Uh, and in that, uh, he was later dubbed, but Frank Oz is doing the performance of Ma Otter. Oh, okay. In it. So he's doing the onset, much like David Prowse. Mm-hmm. In his uh, delightful accent, was was doing Darth Vader on set. Uh, Frank Oz was doing so. Yes, that is done. Or when you have two characters in a scene that are gen or performed by the same performer. So if you have Kermit and Ralph the dog in a scene, those are both Jim Henson characters. So one of them is going to have to be performed by somebody else besides Jim Henson. Hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I guess you couldn't. Do yeah, too or, many or Piggy ex- and Fozzie. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, the the question was Frank Oz was both the voice and puppeteer for Yoda, quite the accomplishment in a film series that hasn't trusted any man to be the voice and body of Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> what do you think it does for a puppet performer to portray both speech and action for a single character? I I think that Frank has certainly said over years that he has a genuine investment and love of Yoda as a character. And I think that is certainly uh, made stronger if you know that you're also what people are seeing on screen. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm sure that there's, you know, certainly a disconnect for a performer who, you know, would show up at a convention or in front of him and go, well, I'm the body of Darth Vader. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So, you know, you, there's a weird disconnect there that, uh, you know, obviously Frank doesn't have to deal with. But, there's you know, Frank does deal with that now Yeah. with the prequels when you have a CG yeah. Yoda. That's not his physicality. That's animators animating that. And he's coming in and dubbing over that. Uh, well, you know, I'm sure he provided a vocal track first and then I wonder what, uh, they um, animated to that. I wonder what puppeteers feel more invested in or feel more connected to doing the body or the or the voice and it's it's probably different for different people yeah yeah but i think there's something to be said for you know if it's a vocal character they're sort of intrinsic so i think they probably wouldn't see much differentiation between it it's just you know for them it's an extension of them as a performer it'd be the same as if they were on stage doing that without a puppet Mm mm-hmm you know, that is the totality of their performance is everything you see. It just happens that, you know, 99% of the, the, the movement is on the end of their arm <laughs> as yeah. opposed to their entire body. Yeah. But, you know, they're still acting and performing 
you know, that, that, that vocalization is, you know, that'd be like the same thing of, you know, a singer. Yeah. Who you could also say that 99% of that is their vocalization. I mean, I feel like if I had to choose between doing voice and the movements, I think I would choose voice or I feel like that would be the more, the more iconic and lasting. Well, I mean, that's ultimately what the audience is. That's what I hear. Yeah. Is going to, uh, certainly build the character around in their minds. But this might change if I actually knew how to work with puppets. So I'm saying this from the perspective of someone who doesn't. You know what? Uh, it's the, you know, you can make a puppet out of that Yoda hanging on your door behind you. Uh, um, okay. I mean, you can animate that. I mean, is that, is that a backpack? That's the backpack that came yeah. out, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't, you just, I can stick my hand in it. This is true. Yeah. I mean, at that point, even if you don't have, you know, I can do it with this. Like, you know, you can animate something without having to operate the mouth on something. <laughs> this Yoda has just been hanging in this room, sort of. Well, it was hanging on two things, but then um, some a listener, Alex, different Alex, if you're listening to this, <laughs> called me out saying, like, why is Yoda being tortured? Like, it was just so disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to say, like, I was trying to make Yoda do look like he's doing pull-ups or something. But no, people weren't having it. They said it looked like he was being crucified, he was being tortured. And so now it just looks like Yoda's dead. I'm gonna get I'm gonna go get him. Yeah, go <laughs> All right. Yoda is not hanging tortured anymore. So are right you able here. to put your Oh my gosh. Well, I don't think I can actually stick my hand up his butt. I think I have to. <laughs> but you can go you can go go up the back of his cloak oh, and yeah. hold the back of his You head. know this backpack, don't you? <laughs> okay. I can't I can only like kind of hold him here. I can't actually put my Okay, hand but in now, his head. so if you just like just have him look in the camera. <laughs> so have find the eye contact there. So now and then nod. Like he's listening. Yeah, this thing. God, it's harder than thing. it looks. God damn it! It's a very. St- I know it's a very stiff. It's like really <laughs> stuffed to the. I'm sorry if any kids are but, watching. But I'm probably scarring look- you. <laughs> <laughs> but he does look animate right yeah. now. Yeah. As far as you know, there is movement. Yeah, watch out, Palpatine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a very weird face <laughs> on that. They, it, they truly, truly, they didn't. Do the best. Job. I mean, if you, if you compare that here, I'll hold this up. There, there's the. Oh yeah, that's see now that's Yoda. They didn't give him enough wrinkles in the chin. He actually kind of looks like the Muppet, you know, the the two old guys, which I can't remember which one. He looks one. like uh, he looks like Waldorf. Yes. Waldorf Waldorf is the wider one. Statler yes. is the longer face. Yeah, he looks like Waldorf. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well. <laughs> Okay, well, Get speaking the Jedi of... Get off the stage! Yes. I recently, like a few weeks ago, saw a Muppet Christmas Carol live to picture um, with an orchestra, and it was... Oh, brilliant. Was that yeah. at the, the... It was in Australia. Or? It was it was in Australia. I was I was there in December. And How um, was it? It was amazing. It, I think I... It was... I loved that it was in a smaller hall because I could see everything. Like, it, in a bowl concert... I don't know. I, I feel like I don't enjoy those as much. And they're, they're so massive that you don't really get to pick up on the details. From... Yeah. Yeah. I loved seeing it in actual in an actual like theater. Um, yeah. And yeah, the, I, I'd never seen. So how often do they do they do a pretty good job of staying in sync? Yeah, they did. Um, well, the songs remained. Like they, yeah, they performed the score only, like the only the orchestra, you know, because the songs and the score were kind of different teams. So, right, yeah. But my fear would be that you'd have some drift, even a little bit, where the score doesn't quite match up with the visuals. It was really synced. Well, I think it helps that the songs were still preserved, so right, we weren't going to see any like lip syncing or any like, I don't know, any words. Wrong. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really good. It's really good. So uh, would do again? Yeah, I would I would definitely do it again. I would love to do it with like a different Muppets movie. Um But I need to see them all. I need to 
go I know. back to the Muppet movie and I know. I really want there. to see I want to see the first Muppet movie. I've seen some of the newer ones. Um but yeah, I gotta go back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're never gonna puppeteer that Yoda backpack again, are you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It might be a who knows. It could be a gag this season. Um <laughs> but it's kind of creepy, so I don't know. I'll have to I I'll wait for listener his feedback. Eyes are like a little too <laughs> Far and he, apart. And the thing is, and his, his nose is a little long. And the thing is, his head is, twi- is it's not, it doesn't sit forward. It like goes to the side, probably because when you wear it as a backpack, it probably oh, you're supposed is, to be peering not, over your shoulder. I think that's what it is. I was going to say so that you don't hit your like head. Like Luke's wearing it where he's like sort of yeah. looking over. Yeah, I think so. So he's like looking to the left permanently, but kind of up. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, well, this goes into another question that was, how important was or is it for designers to craft puppets that move well and can endure the heat and stress of a film set? Is there some sort of bell curve or Venn diagram out there describing the perfect balance between puppets that look amazing but fall apart versus those that can take a beating but look like they already have? And where would you place the Empire Strikes Back Yoda puppet in terms of durability versus beauty? Or is this a false dichotomy? Uh, you know, I think you, you definitely need something that is actually performable. I mean, if you can't, if something is so rigid, you can't get any nuance out of it, then it sort of fails as, as a, a, a good puppet mm-hmm. for the screen. Uh, you know, durability, I mean, this is, I think he's basically what, a foam latex puppet, uh, you know, that can always tear that can, you know, anything could happen with it. I mean, it's, it's going to hold up for the duration of, and then I'm sure there were backups. I'm sure there was a swap out. I'm sure there were repairs that were made in the moment on things like that. that you never saw, uh, you know, ultimately you just need it to do what it's going to do. You're not, you know, the, the, these things aren't made for, to be forever things. Yeah. So as long They're as it holds up long good. enough to get the shots yeah. and get the movie done, <laughs> That's all you need from it. Is it common uh, to have backups of the puppets? Yeah, oh, yeah certainly. Um, for something like this, I, I'm sure that there were backup heads. Uh, and and you've seen, uh, you know, have you ever seen any back uh, behind the scenes footage? There were practice mm, uh, okay. ones so they could actually do the blocking and oh. do the run throughs without having to use the full on camera oh. puppet. Okay. So that you know, it was. It's basically you know, it looks like a, a stuffed animal. It's more similar to the backpack that you have than the final Yoda. So, but that's something that you don't want the wear and tear or the weight if you're just getting everything sorted as far as blocking. Mm-hmm. You'll have that because again, this is you know your performer arm raised up. You don't want a lot of weight on there. It's you know, already long days. It's already stressful, you know, and you don't want your arm to be wilting when you're trying to get a performance out of it, you know, and you'll, you don't want the puppet to fight against you. Like if, if, if it's sturdy, think about all of the pressure you're having to put just to open that up. If this is not giving. Yeah. If this is, if you're having to pry that open every time, think of how stressful that's going to be to try and do anything with that for an extended period of time or give any nuance to it. If it's, you know, you'll see if you ever go into stores and they have like the weird puppets in there, you might pick up and you're like, Oh, this thing is this hurts mm. to try and puppeteer. Yeah. Like you're it fighting hurts to try to the move stuffing your in it or yeah. yeah. It's a lot you like know, playing an instrument, you know, or it's measured incorrectly. You know, think about, you know, what if measurement you ever put like a, a child's problem. puppet on mm-hmm. and you notice that, you know, child's puppet, let's say the mouth ends there, but obviously your finger mid- goes on longer yeah. than that. Ken is pointing to like you know, mid thumb, you know, the feeling of, yeah, you, yeah. you're doing it all with so like the very ends of your fingers. Yeah. 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 It'd be super uncomfortable. Yeah. So you, you know, you want a proper fit as a performer. You want something that you can get the most out of. So you know, certainly there were measurements and tests and, and that to get to a good, because this was in development for a while before they ever got to set. 
So, you know, they would have gone through runs. They would have seen what worked and what, what looked great and, uh, you know, what was performable. Because you don't want to get, you know, there and with so much writing on this character and it looked kind of janky <laughs> on screen yeah. or be something that you have, you know, one of the best performers out there coming in to, to perform this and, you know, they're like performing a brick. Do the performers have any say in the design usually or not? <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, something like the, the Muppet Workshop, I mean, that was all just a tightly knit group. So, you know, there was the performers and then the puppet builders, they were all together, mm. you know, and they were all working towards the same goal. It was a much more loose atmosphere. So... You know, generally, that is the best case scenario to where you would go in and, you know, there's, you know, Kermit's pattern for making a Kermit, you know, the original Kermit would have been tailored to the size of Jim Henson's hand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because that's optimally what it, you know, that's where you get the best Kermit <laughs> is if it's, you know, it's, it's made to fit Jim's proportions, which Wait. he would have done when he made the original Kermit. Because he made the original Kermit out of his mother's house coat. Oh, I did not know that. Huh. Today I learned. So. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, <laughs> what you're saying about the working again, like the... Okay, so your answer to that question was basically durability is not the priority. Getting something that is conducive to the performance is the priority. Yes, and, and then it, it just has to be durable enough to get the shot. Yeah, exactly. Um but when you were speaking about just having to work against the des like a bad design too much where it's like fatiguing or or whatever that does remind me a lot of playing an instrument where or if you don't have you know something that fits you um or if you're you haven't learned um like a lot of violin technique revolves around minimizing effort where when people are perhaps miming the violin, like they'll usually raise their arms way too much because they, it, it looks like you're, you know, I don't know, they'll push down too much or like raise their arm too much. Okay. So if I were to mime, yeah. I would go like this. Yeah. Sure. And then when you think about playing, like people normally press too hard when, when in reality, like the ideal, like baseline bow stroke is, you're just letting gravity do the work. You shouldn't be having to push down. And, and and I guess using your bottom jaw moving in a puppet, like you don't want to be having to push down so 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 much. You 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 know you would get very. Well, I mean, you can't get to with the end of a long piece if you're constantly yeah. fighting. Exactly. And yeah, yeah. So when certain types of tension will show up, like I'll just like. Like I'm putting using no pressure at all. All I'm doing is like pulling the bow like a string. The bow itself is heavy enough that it should, if you're just pulling it, it should make a sound. Um, and you yeah. know where that fluidity should be. Like you know, you know where the violin should be placed. You know where yeah. your arms should be placed. Where the bow should be placed. The angle of attack on that to give you the ability. And the same thing, you know, you'll find that you know performer will find that with a puppet. Yeah, and it's not that it like is. it's not like there's never any pressure, but as at a, as a baseline, like if it just is easy, then you can manipulate and you know add pressure in specific places and you know kind of shape it, you know, sculpt the the motions, kind of yeah, kind I mean, of like the a puppet. puppet. Is, it is it, it's it's an instrument. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's something being performed, and if you're not having to constantly think about fighting that. Mm -hmm. Then you can think about just the performance or just the nuance. If you're not going, oh my god, my arm's tired. Oh my gosh, why is this so hard? Yeah, like oh, it hurts too much to like open the mouth, so I'm just gonna avoid something there, which happens. Yeah, or on I instruments. Can't just, I just can't wait for this piece to finish. Yeah, just get to the end of this thing. Yeah, if I'm in pain, like I'll, I'm more prone to taking shortcuts to, you know, maybe skipping that extra thing that would have made it more expressive because it's too much drama. It's gonna be too much effort to do that thing. And that's not where you want to be as a performer. And you also don't want it to get to a point where the audience can pick up on that. Mm. And know that you're struggling. Mm -hmm. Like if you, like if you're listening to 
a performance, let's say of, of, you know, maybe not a seasoned professional, but, you know, let's say you're sitting in a concert recital in middle school, you know, you're looking at middle schoolers playing who maybe haven't learned technique yet. Mm -hmm. You can, you can hear them struggling, right? Yeah. So that's communicated to the audience. And so now you as someone in the audience just going, oh boy, this is, you're just focusing on the thing that's the struggle part. That's not sounding quite right because of those performance aspects haven't been refined. Yeah. Whereas the perfect medium is like, you're not even thinking about it. All you're thinking, of, you're existing within the performance as an audience member. That's the, that's the optimum of what the performer wants too. I wonder if this is like a human, like evolutionary thing to feel like that sympathetic struggle. Um, Also, I think people do it with like embarrassment too, like where the, like the sympathetic cringe or something that, um, because it is more effortless to listen to something that sounds effortless than it is to listen to something or watch something that looks effortful. Right. Because I I think, I think the, the perception is that there's a greater skill involved if you don't see someone straining at it yeah but I, f- I feel like it goes even more i feel like it goes even beyond that because you could even you could you could want to support that person it could be your own child or something you could but still like it feels mo- it feels like a little bit more effort to get through it when the performer is struggling or when you sense that the performer is struggling like maybe i'm like holding my breath a little bit more or like kind of clenching a little bit i don't know yeah kind of you say there's an audience where you're going, just I hope they get to the end of this piece. Just please yeah. let yeah. 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 We'll we'll have we'll have pizza afterwards. We'll, we'll <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about this ever again. This is okay. We're just gonna get through this. Uh, okay. <laughs> so let's continue. How you get so big that you fold of this kind? <laughs> Friend, we didn't mean to land in that puddle, and if we could get our so Yoda is struggling up. It's so petty the way he says that line. <laughs> Cannot get your ship out. <laughs> ah. oh. But I think, but I think if you're thinking about the lesson being imparted, if we're going back to that, then that's another test for Luke. Is like, mm-hmm. you know, how are you how are you responding to this? <laughs> yeah, you know, Luke this is, is a this really is a stressful failing. situation. Yeah, I mean he's a complete jerk. Luke is a total jerk in yeah. this whole scene. Mm-hmm. To, to the point of also the ew ick of tossing away the food. Yeah, yeah. That totally. Yoda took a little nibble on. Yeah, basically, yeah. Like uh, this creature like, is ugh. touching my stuff. Yeah. And the you didn't even break creature. off the piece that he's like, no, this is a total loss for this ration. Just yeah, don't toss really. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, dissing his home world and, you know, Yoda's like, this is my home. Uh, all of that. Luke yeah, is- this is so dismissive. It's like, Luke, do you remember the, the desert, you know, uh, hole in the ground that you came from that you were just complaining about? Really? Yeah. Kind of a high horse you're on now. <laughs> what do you yeah well his it's obvious how frustrated he luke is getting um he sees also the situation that he's in and it feels sorry for himself or feel sees he sees these obstacles but doesn't see that they are all uh that they are hardly the obstacles that are the real obstacles like in his journey he sees these trivial things. I mean, I guess they're not trivial, but for someone, eventually he will come to know them as trivial. Like, can't get a ship out. Um, you know, these these sort of surface level, these sort of like, I don't know, like muggle problems. Like, you know, like, and yeah, Yoda is, definitely seems like he's teasing him. Like, oh, what a cry, baby. Can I get your ship out? <laughs> like, yeah. Also, he never asks for help mm. at the start here. He, you know, he's encountered this this creature uh, is immediately like, is get off, go away. Not, hey, you live here. I'm trying to find Master Yoda. Do you know a Master Yoda? Yeah. Like, there's no diplomacy whatsoever in his interaction. Right, he just there's, completely there's dismisses. no even attempt at it. Yeah, he just, yeah. <laughs> it's, 
honestly, the way that Luke I mean, he pulls a blaster here, on him first. <laughs> yeah, true. I feel like this scene is, um, in addition to being, you know, funny, part of Luke's journey, whatever, um, there's a part of it that is like, we've all been that person before. And uh, I don't know if to, th- to think about it like, like that. Like, I don't think there's a single person who has ever inadvertently, without even knowing they were doing it, like, been short with someone. Dehuman, or no, I mean, like, dehumanized someone, whether or not, whether or not, like, whether directly or indirectly, like, not. I don't know, just not ask, like not asking someone who would seem like an unlikely good source for anything. I don't know. I, I feel like we've all passed over um, oh, people. I think, yeah, I've certainly been dismissive yeah. in life. Yeah. and uh, Or just so caught up in your own head that you're like, listen, I'm, I'm on a mission. I got to get this thing done. And you're just an impediment because yeah. you're wasting my time. I'm just needing to, you're so hyper-focused on doing the thing rather than observing the potential of things around you to help in the thing you're trying to do. Yes. So like this scene is sort of like a parable within the larger parable, within the larger legend or whatever, which I feel like this sort of parable has been told many times in in many cultures where it's like the stranger who looks like a beggar, like knocks on your door and you don't, whatever, you don't realize who, who it is. And you know, the, the first person who, um, invites them in and asks how they're doing or whatever, finds out that they're like the king or some god or something like that. Um, Otherwise, you could turn into a beast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you were yeah. a real jerk. Yeah. So, lesson but, learned. But, but, but Luke sort of had that arc in the first film, too. I mean, you know, he sort True of gets to that frustration point. Well, you think the Death Star run. Like, he failed. He failed in the, his first run in the, the trench, you know, as far as. True. So it's when he finally just let it, everything go. And just like, hey, it, it, when he got to the take a breath moment, it's like, I know you're getting frustrated. This is high. This is a tense situation. Chill out. Think about it. <laughs> Relax a minute. You're all up in your head right now. Take a yeah. breath. And he's clearly hangry right now. I'm sure there's, he's a little That's bit. True. He hasn't had his snacks. <laughs> you know, there's not, there's not, I'm sure there's, it's hard to stow snacks in that tiny little X Wing cockpit. Yeah. And his maybe he spilled, are... maybe he spilled his snacks in there. You can't really reach down and reach anything. Uh, I mean, I do also, you know, simultaneously feel for Luke in this moment, knowing that he won't stay here for the rest of his life, but yeah. Also, what a jerk is, I'm sorry, for people I know who love Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I like Obi-Wan too, but you couldn't provide an introduction. Well, you just off, are you behind a tree right now going, mm, oh, this is funny. Well, <laughs> it, it is like a sequence of tests though. I feel like they're making him work for it a little bit on purpose. Right. But you, you got to imagine that Ben is just, you know, ghostly behind the tree. Oh, yeah, he could have popped in. Yeah, he could have popped in so much sooner. By the way, that's yeah. Yoda. Yeah, Yoda. Yeah. Luke, Luke, Yoda. You two talk now. I'll be gone. But then he wouldn't have been able to learn from his failure. And that's kind of Luke's thing. Right, right. But, <laughs> so they did kind of set Luke up. Yeah. B- ben knowingly set Luke up. Ben also provided no description whatsoever for Master Yoda. Very true. <laughs> or here's here's the secret void. You know, there's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing. He can... <laughs> oh my gosh. Also, maybe even just a little. He dresses kind of like me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Well, okay. Um, okay. So at this point, uh, Yoda is crawling. It's uh, actually hilarious. A uh, shot where he Yoda is crawling into like Luke's luggage, his crate, um, and tossing the stuff out. Yeah, you just like see him like wiggling. <laughs> you see his like little butt. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good stuff. Here, I'll do it with the with the backpack. It's like like that. Okay, and you, but you, but you feel like that's alive. 
Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. Think about the performance of that because you have the arms being performed mm-hmm. as he's tossing the stuff out, the head's being performed. You got a full performance of him looking back and acknowledging as he's tossing things back. Very true. You have that wiggle, but he but it all looks like there's a weight to it. Mm-hmm. Like there's no point where his feet lift up and yeah. you don't feel like he's actually rummaging around in this yeah. thing. Yeah. And his little grunts and everything. Um yeah, they seal they kind of seal the whole the whole scene. Uh okay, let's continue. Get your phone of this kind. Listen, friend, we didn't mean to land in that puddle, and if we could get our ship out, we Here's would. Here's where he off. starts. Why don't you just get your ship out? Hey, get out of there. No. Oh. Hey, you could have broken this. <laughs> don't do that. Oh, also shout out to the sound mixers, because um, to also sell the fact that Yoda is talking at us like his voice is reflecting from the inside of the crate so it's not coming at us directly on so that also helps sell the positionality of like yoda's body and 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 mouth oh you're making a mess hey I don't want another test here. Oh, Yoda's really trying. I want your help. I want my lamp back. I'm gonna need it to get out of this slimy mud hole. Mud hole? Slimy? My home this is! And now R2 and Yoda lamp tug of war. R2, let him have it. Now, the performance of him doing the reach over to grab his cane. So, in that moment, there's clearly a live hands situation. What do you mean? So, so nor- normally you would think that um, most of the Yoda scenes, you don't need articulated fingers or uh-huh. hands. Yeah. So it's probably just operating like on a rod. Like if I put this on, these arms are on a rod. Yeah. Because he's not having, but there's fine motor control when he's reaching across to grab the cane. Mm. So I bet for that scene, that is just, that's live hands that someone's wearing like a glove to grab that cane. Oh. But there's something about the fact that it's a reach over that even it was imbues more character into Yoda. So he's doing the tug of war and then reaches over to grab the cane and doing the like mad grasp for it before he finally grabs it. Again, it's that feeling of okay. realism that you just, from those little beats, you yeah. buy the character. Like, it doesn't just feel like, you know, a puppet, you know, you picked up as a five-year-old to articulate. It's like, oh, this thing, look, he's like, he's grabbing for the yeah. cane. Yeah. But it's just little beats like that that build the realism that you just go right by. But you look at the performance of that. Like, if you rewind right now, just watch, watch his grabbing motion. And the fact that he's looking over at it, as you would in that situation where you're frustrated. I'm in a tug of war. I'm trying to grab that cane. I can't quite get it. I'm, where is that cane? I'm looking over. And then when he gets it and actually starts doing the hitting <laughs> on, on R2. That's a good point. Is it a live, is it a live hand also? Like whenever his claw, he does like his claw hand or. So I would say that the one, like it's. Probably the one that has the, uh, that's holding the lamb Mm -hmm. is just a static hand. There's no articulation to that. That Mm -hmm. was probably made to where you could have the tug of war. It's not going to tear. It's not going to break. There's no hand in that. That's just an object on that. That's like the rod hand because it's having to engage in that tug of war. And I would say that the one doing that left hand is probably Frank Oz. This whole performance is probably Frank Oz. Mm. Because, except for the tug of war, because Frank is right-handed, which means that he can operate that left hand with his actual left hand. So he's operating the head with his right. Because you usually use your dominant hand for the mouth. Right. So that's Mm -hmm. why, uh, in in puppeteering terms, sometimes you'll hear the term a right-hander when it's a, a... 
uh, character that needs to uh, have both hands be operational. Because if you're a performer who's right-handed, you're able to do the head with your right hand. Your left hand is doing the left arm. You're going to need somebody else's arm to do the right hand. So then you need a performer who's your right-hander. Oh, okay. So because you're doing this, you're doing the left hand, another person's having to do the right hand. So if you look at a character like Fozzie Bear, Fozzie Bear has live hands. Mm. He doesn't have, like, Grover has hands that are on rods. So does yeah. Kermit. They don't actually have hands inside, like, gloves. Yeah. Operating live hands. Fozzie does. So Frank Oz has the head with his right hand. Left hand is doing the left arm. Somebody else is right-handing him to do so Fozzie is a two puppeteer performance. Oh my gosh, the coordination. <laughs> yeah, so think about that extra level. So right now you have someone who is doing the tug of war, who would be technically his right hander in this. And Frank is doing the head of Yoda and doing that left arm grabbing yeah. for the cane. Yeah, okay. So here, yeah, I see. It's kind of a dark, uh, blurry picture, but... Yeah, you can cl clearly see both of his hands here, and well, but both of them aren't yeah. cause. But just the fact that he's so he's doing the struggle, he's get, doing the frustration, and doing that look over to where is that cane? I know it's here. Yeah, that's yeah. I hadn't even I hadn't really. Yeah, that's the first time I've thought about that scene like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely. It's the little nuances like that. Like, I, you know, it's it's one of those things that the equivalent, uh, I don't know if you saw that, um, the Matilda musical. Not yet, recently on, uh, I've heard well, good. Well, it is brilliant. Tim okay. Minchin, I think, is a brilliant songwriter, and I uh, saw the show multiple times. It's a great score. It's, it's just great. Um, but there was a viral TikTok thing that happened recently with one of the dance scenes in it, and there's one of the, the prominent dancers in the scene does a little motion, but there's a little eye roll that they do along with it. And everyone caught on to this little nuance mm -hmm. piece of the performance that plussed. Like, it could have just been the coordination of this incredible dance sequence, but the fact that it goes with this little added bit of character with it just deepens your appreciation. And it's looking at stuff, you know, when you go through and watch amazing puppeteering or amazing animation, it's the little beats that I find fascinating on this. It's like the little flourishes that come from, you know, again, you, musicality. Like, you know as a performer, I'm sure, that Absolutely. the things that you, the little flourishes you'll put in just because you're comfortable. Yeah. Comfortable and you and have And beginners can't usually level. do the flourishes. They might, yeah. Because they're too busy trying to, oh my gosh, what? A, where's, what's the note? Where's yeah. the finger placement for that? What's the, oh no, there's you know, two in their head mm -hmm. about the mechanics of it. Whereas when the mechanics, the basic mechanics become, you know, muscle memory and, you know, just wrote because you attain that skill level, then you're able to put the polish on it that introduces the personality. So I think, you know, again, it, it's very comparable to playing an instrument. You know, this is a puppet is very much an instrument for a, a puppeteer. Uh, so yeah, the little moments like this, I love seeing in, in Frank's performance of just those little beats or when he'll take a breath and you think this is not a thing that breathes, mm -hmm. but when like Yoda does that sigh later on, when, when Luke has failed mm. and Luke has given up like, and he's just like, <sighs> and you think that's all in that exhalation. That's all in performance because there's no lungs there. Yeah. It's just knowing your placement and frame, if you're the performer, what imparts the feeling of it's going to come across like this character has lungs and is feeling the weight of this moment. And the fact that Yoda is so alive as a character by the time you get to that point, that you're believing that, oh, wait, Master Yoda is like really disappointed in him yeah, right I now. Mean, I've never questioned like, Yoda's ability to breathe. You so. get the, like you... You understand Luke's failure in that moment because of Yoda's response. Mm-hmm. 
and that's that long exhalation. And then Yoda going into that Zen moment of, oh, I'll show you, listen, you, this is, this is what you're capable of that you just gave up on. Yeah. And that's, that's a puppet. That's a thing yeah, on a yeah. guy's arm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is doing all of that. It's incredible. There's the same a, thing that you could say that, you know, that, that is a, you know, a big piece of wood yeah. that you're holding in your hand. Yeah. That you can make sounds that super, you're playing, you know, it could brighten up. It could, you could play something lively and spunky, or it could be like so tragic. You, you could, the range and, and with Yoda, it's like the, some of the funniest moments and some of the most grounded, like reverent moments as well. Like, oh, and, Ravi, and, like, and, yeah. and musically, you know, you know what you can ring out of an instrument with just the subtlest of of notes and performances within that instrument. Like you know how to how to hit that thing to get a response. Mm -hmm. And the fact, you know, the same thing with that puppet is knowing that tiny little range that imparts that little that little touch of emotion. And that's just, you know, that's an understanding of human nature and, and human perception and being to that point. I mean, it's, it's a remarkable performance and that, yeah. you know, and this is obviously more realistically styled than you would think a, you know, a Muppet who's just fleece or fur or flock to be, but you look at those little beats again, where people perceive that, you know, Oh, you know that point where Miss Piggy closed her eyes? No, because mm. she doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> she doesn't. She doesn't yeah. close her eyes. Her her pupils do not move. Their eyes do not move. You know, there are some characters that have articulated lids, like Gonzo has articulated lids, but they're not blinking. You know, Animal has articulate, but it's not. It's not the nuance. Their pupils are not moving around. That's all in. You know, and the, the magic of the Muppets of operating within that frame, knowing that it's a close-up, knowing how intimate a frame is. And so the audience is going to be able to perceive a little subtlety of movement, a little cocking of the head, a little look to this side, a little look to that side. It's, it's magical, but it's magic born of immense skill and talent. Absolutely. Yes. So I have a deep appreciation for that, you know, for puppeteers and musicians. Me too. I'm very inspired. And, and because I feel like the little, the little details or like people who can point out the little details are like, the, those are the, those are things that I want to know about. Because I feel like as an audience member, even not a like puppet expert, I feel like subconsciously I, I feel the different, like subconsciously I think there is an effect on me. Um, even if I can't point out what the subtleties were, like, I know that there is something different about it. And so it's cool and to hear. Bad pup, you know, I, that at the episode, well, the original episode one, Yoda is not a good puppet. Hmm. It's not a well-designed puppet, you know, and it looks uncanny because you really can't see the connection. It doesn't look like Yoda. First so the foremost. first CGI was Attack of the Clones. Yes, and then they went back and swapped out the puppet episode one Yoda with CGI. So oh. if you go watch episode one now, it has the CGI Yoda. Yeah. If you saw it in the theaters, and I think the first home video release, it's the puppet okay. Yoda. Okay. So if you go on YouTube, it's fascinating to look. I if really want to see it, now. I'm assuming you haven't seen it. You well, can see what the original no, episode I, I one puppet Yoda was. Okay, yeah, I'm. I was too young to rem to remember that, and certainly for it to like stand out. But yeah, um, and now every time you would have seen it, would have been just CGI, the CGI yeah. swap out. Okay, I'm definitely gonna look this up on YouTube. <laughs> but there is, a, if you if you look up, uh, just like I think Puppet Yoda Evolution or uh, Episode One, someone's put together a video that shows Fantastic. the two different versions, and you can see it's it's a clunky puppet, like it doesn't have the nuance. So, you know, you can only wring so much emotion from a stone if it if the puppet's fighting you. And the design was really fighting poor Frank on mm. that episode one puppet. Well, I have some related questions for you also from my Discord server, which are like, okay, Ender was curious. 
about your opinions on Yoda's portrayals over the years. Um, and, and a couple people were saying like, well, he says, I am of the opinion that most lay people and many writers do not know how to write dialogue for Yoda. And then someone else was bringing up, um, Rob was saying there's like a paper written some time ago about Yoda's wacky dialogue patterns, comparing the original trilogy to later works and something about like how in later works, I think they mix up his words even more, like they emphasize it even more and sort of um, maybe flanderize the character a little bit. What are your or thoughts? it becomes a caricature yeah. is what they're essentially. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's easy to dip it into caricature, but I mean, what it also depends on what works you're talking about. Like I thought he was, he felt like Yoda in Clone Wars, which is the most Yoda we've seen. True. You know, what other works are we talking about? Because you like basically sequels? then you're just talking about the, the, the prequels. The holiday special. No, the, 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 the Star Wars Legos stuff. Yes, you know, the Star Wars Lego <laughs> stuff. I mean, but that's going for comedy. Everyone is caricatured in the Lego stuff. So I think that's it's hard to bring that into the discussion. Well, what do you think you know, about like the return of the Jedi puppet? The fan, well, you already mentioned your thoughts on the, fan, the Phantom Menace one, but the the Last Jedi. And what do you think about the CGI? How do you think that? How did that I work think, out for you? I think the CGI is a lot better than the puppet you'll see from Episode One. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, at that point, we're just sort of having to reassess this Yoda of a different period. Yeah. Like, I think it takes some getting used to, certainly. Mm-hmm. But then I I buy it as the same character. Yeah. Uh, um, and I certainly, you know, the Clone Wars Yoda, I think, is great. You know, and he got a couple of solid storylines. Like, that's, uh, what, six season storyline when he... The, with the trials of Yoda. Yeah, that's one of my favorite arcs. Learning. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely brilliant throughout. You know, I think we got a lot of you, and nothing about that seemed caricatured to me. Yeah. In the writing. You know, so is it that when the, then, so it's, I don't know what they're referencing as far as if it's a Lego stuff, then that's comedy. No, no, I don't, it's I don't think for comedy. So no, I don't think that was it. I think it if was it's mostly fan stuff. Then I think I it was think, like yeah. prequels and sequels mainly. Yeah. I mean, and the I felt the last Jedi portrayal certainly felt like the Yoda, and that was an actual puppet. I think that's as close as they've come to the original puppets. It's not quite the same design. Yeah. Uh, do you feel uh, like the vo- for- do you feel like the syntax becomes even more like I don't know? I'm an old Jedi, Ma- Mister Rogers teacher. I'm in, only speaking in wise quotes now. But he doesn't. I mean, his yeah, no, first thing is basically joking at, you know, like, chill out, Luke. Yeah, that's true. You know, yeah. By the way, boom, there's lightning. That thing's gone. Now let's, now let's have a talk. Will you just chill out? You're so uptight right now. Are you going to learn from any of your mistakes? Mm. You know, and, and who knows? The other thing we have no context for is what are the conversations they may have had in the intervening years? He's yeah, a force true. ghost. You know, do, do they have like, you know, regular coffee meetings? Is this like a joking relationship we've never seen developed before he shut himself off from the force? You know, is this you know, is it what, every once in a while? Was it just like him, his dad, and, and Ben just hanging out, talking about old Jedi texts and, and the weather? We I, don't, we don't I know. loved Yoda in The Last Jedi. I thought I, I was a huge fan of that seen that whole well that yeah. well, when he does his little like you know happy stamp mm-hmm. when he's really enjoying his joke when he's sitting there yeah when luke is freaking out they're like yeah this is jedi texts yeah and, and he's like no you need to chill out this is fun what do you someone asked if if i was going to ask well jeremy asked are you going to ask about seagulls and <laughs> It looks like you know what that is. <laughs> no, uh, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the sequel version was my stick. I mean, they're both great. They both bop. We're talking about parody, uh, bad lip readings of Yoda turned into songs. Uh, I mean, I'll put know. links if, if people haven't haven't heard but of ben, these. Ben also had a great song. We can't forget Bushes oh, of Love. That's oh okay. The the yes the the Kenobi song, I didn't know. Uh, 
but yes, the <laughs> Yoda will be forever tied to seagulls as well. <laughs> I'm going to play a clip from, okay, because actually uh, other Yoda voices, um, other people who have portrayed Yoda. So there's Tom Kane in The Clone Wars. So play a clip. Hmm. To Ilum, we must go. Hmm. Very little time there is, Senator. Our only hope to rescue Jedi. To Ilum, we must go now. A slight detour. Jeopardize the mission. It will not. So that's Tom Kane. Thoughts? I, I mean, didn't hear the clip. Oh, you didn't? Oh. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was completely silent. That's my so. bad. Okay. I had myself <laughs> muted there. Mm, sorry about that. Okay. Well, no thoughts. To Ilum, we must go. Mm. Very little time there is, Senator. Our only hope to rescue Jedi. To Ilum, we must go now. A slight detour. Jeopardize the mission. It will not. I think it's great. I mean, you know, this is also he's been he's given a lot more dialogue mm -hmm. in Clone Wars than Frank ever had to perform. Yeah. In the films. And a lot of exposition. Yes, and plus Clone Wars era Yoda isn't his isn't in his like old man retirement like, I don't know, silly phase. He's very business down to business all the time. Yeah, well, there's some playfulness that comes out yeah. every once in a while. And I think a little bit of that playfulness when comes out younglings. even with Frank in the youngling scene in Attack of the Clones when he's sort of quizzing oh, yeah. them on trying to figure out the mystery. Yeah. Yeah. I, in that Mr. Rogers, uh, I'm going back <laughs> yeah. to the, I'm going to stick with that now. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Everything's a teaching moment. It's true. And then we have Eric Jacobson in It's a Very Muppet Christmas Movie. Which I didn't know Yoda was in. Ready is he. There is no tribe, only two. <laughs> Wrong world. Yeah, that one I don't think is. That is closer to a Grover Fozzie. Mm. I think the tone of that is. I think it's a the the pitch is weird to mm -hmm. it. That one feels more like someone doing a Yoda impression. Yeah. I would agree with that. I think Eric Jacobson, I think, didn't he also take over some other of Frank Oz's He's taken over well? all of Frank's characters. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll continue listening. <laughs> I'm just doling out the questions little by little. Yeah. <laughs> or I will help you not. I don't want your help. I want my lamp back. I'm going to need it to get out of this slimy mud hole. Mud hole? Slimy? My home this is! <laughs> R2's sound design is fantastic as well. R2! Hey, move along, little fellow. We got a lot of work to do. No, no, no. Stay and help you, I will. <laughs> Friend. Hmm? I think that is, is sounds like Miss Piggy to me. A little bit. The mine, mine, mine part. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can see that because he goes a little bit higher and cleaner on his delivery on that. Yeah, a little more insistent. I'm not looking for a friend. I'm looking for a Jedi Master. <laughs> okay, Luke. Jedi Master? Yoda. You seek Yoda. You know him? Mm. Take it to him, I will. <laughs> yes, yes, but now, must eat. Come, <laughs> good food. Come. <laughs> I see what you mean by his range just in this clip. Because here he hasn't gone full reverent, like when he starts talking to Obi Wan, but he has shown that he, like, he can be serious for like a second, you know. But then he goes right back to like laughing. Uh, and switching his focus to food, but he's he's given Luke a little bit of a teaser. He name dropped Yoda. But then, aren't we going to get the ultimate tease in the next queue? I think when the music actually comes back in, isn't that the ultimate? Follow yeah, me. Yeah, let's. <laughs> now we're starting the queue five M three. It's called Yoda's Entrance. <laughs> oh, what are we about to hear? 
finally, we hear Yoda's theme on the French horn, but two. it stops. Stay and watch after. That's the end of the five minutes, but we briefly hear it. It doesn't fully play out yet, but yeah. Now, do you feel it's because... Like to me, Luke's feels not like, a believer yet. Yeah, yeah. Luke, Luke is hesitant to. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, yeah. I guess I'll do this. Yeah, I think if Luke, I think it's because of Luke. Yeah, because the music changes back to something more similar to what we were hearing at the beginning of this scene. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. Here, he's following him. We have a harp as well. And now it fizzles out. See, back to the creepy. Back to the creepy stuff. Um, yeah. Luke. Jeez, Luke. Yeah. Take a hint. Take a, take a, yeah. <laughs> if only the characters could hear the, the score. Uh, yeah. This is happening. Hear the harp, you must. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Beckoned you, it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so. Let's see. I think I have maybe one more question, which is, um, do I? Oh, okay. So this is a question from Alex. Oh, I thought that was a question. (laughs) No. Do I have another question? (laughs) It is, Ken, you produced the podcast. We got this with Mark and Hal. In the spirit of their very fine show, please settle this debate. Frank Oz's best voice acting performance is Cookie Monster, Yoda, or Miss Piggy? Oh. Well, since it's we got this with Mark and Hal, they both have to come to a consensus on it. So that includes you in this conversation as well. Oh. So, because when we got this, they're deciding for all time, for everyone in the world. Oh, is that the what, premise? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Well, I know what I'm going to say. So, uh, so do you want We'll do a count of three, and we'll both say who we're thinking of first, then we can talk about why. On On Is three? It... So I'll go three, two, one, and then we'll throw out. Sounds good. Uh, three, two, one. Yoda. Miss Piggy. Oh! <laughs> he, and here's why I say that for my perspective on it, is I think... Yoda, once we get into Yoda's lane, particularly in the Frank Oz performances, which is this different if we're talking about Tom Kane and Clone Wars, mm-hmm. which had a lot more things to do, I think we very quickly arrive basically after this scene to Jedi Master mm-hmm. Yoda in Frank's performances, and that continues through the prequels as well. Miss Piggy, I think, is just all over the place. Like you, you see jealousy, you see rage, you see sweetness, you see, you know, the, you know, sings the, like, like the True. whole range of human emotions as a character are encompassed in Miss Piggy. There's a, you know, a vanity, there's <laughs> a vaingloriousness. There's everything is in that Miss Piggy performance. Whereas, you know, I, I think Yoda just being, ultimately having to get to that point of being the ultimate Jedi master in these films and a guidepost has to very quickly get into his lane mm-hmm. and stay there as a performance range wise. Well, and, he's... and because he's, you know, he, he's mature emotionally, he's not going to go to those anger or jealousy places that, the broader human emotion that Piggy <laughs> yeah. shows yeah. does. This is, yeah, this is like, um, I don't know, like Judeo-Christian gods versus like ancient Greek mythology gods. Yeah. Basically. yeah I, I, to me, Yoda feels constrained by his enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to be a to- being a totally relatable character to the average <laughs> human experience of emotions. <laughs> Constrained by his enlightenment. That's funny. <laughs> um, okay, well, in the spirit of going along with the question based on that show, I will 
I will I will say Miss Piggy. But do so you that, do you think it's Miss Piggy? Or, yeah. Yes. Like like what? Okay. Well, I I pick Yoda because um of the personal because I'm more familiar with because I'm more familiar with Yoda. I took Cookie Monster out of the running because of even because I don't see as much I see even less range with yeah, Cookie Monster. No, yeah. <laughs> um, so it was a non-starter. Yeah, for me it's between Yoda and Miss Piggy. And for me I I I pick Yoda not only because of my familiarity but also because I like the character more. But perhaps the Miss Piggy character, perhaps I like Miss Piggy less because she also reflects so much of the, you know, the worst sides of, you know, of each person, uh, like that with exist within all of us. So, right. Yeah. Miss Piggy is, is perhaps more, I don't want to say uncomfortable to like, but perhaps that's not, I don't know, like her pettiness bothers me sometimes, but probably because I can be petty too, you know? Because it's so relatable. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. Well, I mean, there, Chuck, I, I know if you're familiar with Chuck Jones, a very famous um, uh, Warner Brothers Looney Tunes director. So is the director of like What's Opera Doc and Rabbit of okay. Seville, like the, the, you know, some of the iconic uh, Warner Brothers cartoons of the 50s. Uh, but he was, you know, key in developing... Uh, certain iconic portrayals of Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. You know, Bugs Bunny being, you know, there with a quip, you know, usually on top of a situation. Uh, Daffy Duck just being vain and, and petty. And <laughs> and he had this, this phrase where he's talking about, you know, I'd like to think that I'm Bugs Bunny, but I know that I'm Daffy Duck. Mm. Yeah, I think with Yoda versus Miss Piggy, it is for me, I think, okay, I don't think I act like Yoda whatsoever, but I think... <laughs> Perhaps I, like Miss Piggy does and acts like perhaps I may feel inside sometimes, but I don't act like that. Like I feel like I'm but you can relate pretty calm. To yeah, I can relate to it. And so perhaps there's like a subconscious thing where I'm like, well, that person is doing something like she's being like outward with it. At least I keep it all inward, you know? Right. I want to believe that I'm Yoda about yeah, this but situation. Yeah, exactly. but I'm probably Miss Piggy. <laughs> I think there's a deep watch of Muppet Show coming your I, way soon. There definitely is. Um, one of my friends who has been on the show, shout out to Christina Ward, episode two guest. Um, I discovered recently, because I told her I was singing Muppet Christmas Carol live in concert, and she was like, I've never seen a Muppet thing. <laughs> I'm like, what? What? <laughs> Just, so I told her we have to do a marathon of yeah, all oh, of the Muppets. Yeah. And, and, and understand watching the Muppet show going in that they were still finding their way in the first sort of season and a half, including those characters. I mean, this Piggy doesn't become the Miss Piggy that she becomes really until the middle of the second season. Mm. And it's very much in flux in the first season, including just, you know, being uh, unrecognizable, even the, the design. Uh, that's so interesting so but the thing that is there right from the beginning is i think you'll really love the musical stuff that's throughout it yeah i think and I how too. much it is a key component to the show uh again that sincerity the the comedy but how quickly i think you buy into these characters and this weird soap opera noises off thing that's going on backstage and on stage as they try and put on this show every week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so there's a little bit of a development. It's a rocky start as far as getting to the iconic versions of the characters as they exist today. But even when they do, there's a vibrancy to them because you're seeing those original performers crafting that, developing that, and inhabiting that, whereas today that's not the case. As you even mentioned, Eric Jacobson is doing Frank's characters now. You're not seeing Frank do Piggy today. Mm -hmm. So there's something to be said about, you know, there's there's a, a looseness 
you know, again, talking about that fluency you have in it with an instrument when you're comfortable with it. I mean, that's Frank with his characters because those are his characters. He developed those characters. He's perfectly comfortable putting on a Miss Piggy. Like if you saw in the Muppet thread, when I'd post stuff with the talk show appearances, when all that's unscripted, that's off the cuff. That's just Frank out there being Frank or Jim being Jim. They, those characters were second nature. So they could be those characters on a talk show in the moment doing that, that performance and interaction because it was just a comfort level that isn't quite there now because you know, it's the next generation of performers. So at the end of the day, they're doing impressions, Mm -hmm. you know, no matter, and they're brilliant. Don't get me wrong. They are brilliant performers, but they're also inheriting somebody else's character definition of those characters. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Something that I am sad to have lost, not that the Muppet show even exists anymore, but I feel like the musical aspect is something, uh, I feel like that is such, I don't know, I I wish something like that could be brought back. Uh, I think the music part, um, I don't know, it just adds so much heart and sincerity and music. But there's, there's something about the way the Muppet show was done, that it was like this little island of production in the UK, and they had a house band, they had a house arranger, they would record all their parts in the week, they'd do all this stuff, all of it was this organic group, whereas today, they'd go into a studio, there'd be, you know, it'd be overproduced. Yeah, I think that's what I feel, yeah, that's what I feel now. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how you recapture that aspect in today's sort of world. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, for me as, as a listener who loves that music, there is a warmth to the sound yeah. of those numbers. Uh, that's just indelibly Muppety to me. It, it, it is Muppety. It definitely is. Cause you, cause it's, cause it's characters performing these. And they're not sacrificed. No one's sa- trying to sound pristine. Like a good stinger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everyone is like, we're going in and we're doing this as our characters. You know, yeah. <laughs> this is our character performing this song. And and to the fact that, you know, it's using a jangly piano. It's, it's you feel the live musicians. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, even if it's a pre-record of the song that they're doing sync to on the day for the record, the warmth of that recording exists Mm -hmm. because everyone feels you know there was there's no samples there's nothing electronic about a bunch of musicians getting together in that room and that room sound and producing that and everyone feeling loose and having fun with it like when you hear singing fish and you know and everyone is uh you know gargling their part is that a number that is a number Okay, I'll definitely look uh, that up. And if you look through the clips, there's I I posted footage of them singing fish, doing okay. the doing the gargling, doing the oh, each recording their parts for it while their mouths were full of water. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Yoda might have won if he had had an actual musical number in Star Wars. <laughs> Not just the uh, the uh, the seagulls that we got far later. <laughs> well, Empire Strikes Back doesn't have a diegetic tune. There's no Jedi rocks, or sorry, Yubnub for the purists. Well, uh, we should not Yubnub. What's the a lap to your neck? That's the that was the original Jedi rocks. We should have given just one number to Yoda. one number to Yoda. <laughs> one number in the next what? in the next special edition. So for you, is there an instrument that represents Yoda to you? No, I feel like it, there's more of a like harmony and more of like a a, a melody uh, to Yoda. And I think for me, like if I could, the I, the Lydian thing that I already mentioned earlier with, for me, Yoda is like rising melodies. So it's like dee, dee, like okay, I've done this before, where like I've taken sort of melodies of different like theme character themes and sort of plotted them out like. If if the next note's getting higher, it goes up. If the next note goes lower, it goes down. And so a lot of villains either have like a static 
theme that doesn't go too far up, but certainly goes down. Or like these are descending melodies. And something with like the force theme or with Leia's theme or Yoda's theme, especially, it's like constantly one upping itself in terms of how high it can go. It's like you know it it it's constantly striving upward so that's something i associate with yoda musically and it could be you know his theme will be in various instruments depending on when when it is but yeah it's that constant so you're saying you couldn't peter and the wolf star wars i would be hesitant to you could in broad strokes like you could give like Leia, you could give like oboe. You could give a lot of, you could give like Leia oboe. You could give Yoda oboe as well <laughs> or flute. <laughs> um, you could give like Kylo Ren or like, I don't know, trombones or something. You could give perhaps Luke a trumpet. So like you kind of could, but yeah, it's, I think it's, I think what the instruments are doing says equally as much. Right. Yeah. But now you're going to be thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listeners, if you have any suggestions for what Yoda would be, let me know. I think you could make a strong case for flute, oboe. I think you could make even a strong case for like Celeste or Glockenspiel if you're thinking about the Yoda reveal moment where it's like all those magical sounds. Uh, yeah. So what would C-3PO and R2-D2 be? Oh, definitely, some, def- definitely <laughs> some sort of, like, woodwind ensemble. There is a droids theme in The Empire Strikes Back that is not used again. <laughs> it's only in The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> but I would give the droids something more like that, which is similar to something like the Jawas or, or whatever. Just kind of like a quirky, it, you know, it's like a, kind of quirky woodwind thing usually yeah i can't wait to hear the responses <laughs> yeah, yeah me too let me know uh, if there's a consensus on what yoda should be yeah i will say the one a uh, one character that i could that i could assign a, a, an instrument to would be palpatine which would be the l- low choir but not in this movie in the next movie but yeah the da, da, there's da, another da, one. Da, da, da. Uh, yeah. Um, Who has your favorite theme? The Force theme is my favorite theme. Binary Sunset slash the Force theme slash Ben's theme. But yeah, it is. It's it's hard to name a favorite for sure. But the Force theme, especially when it's able, especially when it's completed, because. Often it's just, and that's it. Sometimes it goes further, but then when it goes to the next section, that's when it's like really clinches it for me. Again, it's constantly rising. And then the way it ends, like that gets So how would Yoda's theme sound laid over the force theme? Oh, laid over the force theme? I guess that could be an interesting project to attempt. Yeah, I don't know. And I can't sing two voices at the same time, so. And I can't sing one. <laughs> <laughs> one thing is the force theme is um, is minor, and Yoda's theme is more so major. So there would be note clashes unless, they're, unless they sort of bent to each other or were... I don't know, organized in a way where it wasn't like the exact themes, but like the shapes of them kind of, I don't know. Yeah. It wouldn't be like an instant mix where you can overlay, like Ray's theme can overlay with the force theme. Ray's theme can overlay with a lot of different themes, which I think is what makes that one kind of compelling and also works if you want to think about slotting her into different, say, families or uh, characters. Her theme is um, very conveniently... uh, I don't know, accessible. Like it's very conveniently adaptable to many different situations, which actually works for her character, her journey, I think. Um, but yeah, I think Yoda's theme 
is more take has a stronger stance to it. Well, now I can't wait to hear some attempt to overlap. So yeah. Whichever your listeners wants to tackle that. Yeah. Listener project. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So I feel to, like we're signing homework. I know. <laughs> so I'm going to go over the cues from these minutes. The cues were 5M2, Yoda appears, and 5M3, Yoda's entrance. The themes that we heard were the force theme and Yoda, the A section. And then if you are following along in on the soundtrack, this would be the track um, Arrival on Dagobah and then also Luke's Nocturnal Visitor. So soundtrack people, there you go. Um, are you ready to move on to the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire before, before we sure. finish? Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so question number one is, in exactly three words, what does Star Wars sound like? Longing, grace, adventure. Oh, I like that combination. Grace and longing, I don't hear very often, but that's what the force theme sounds to me. Is Actually, the force theme contains longing, grace, and adventure. So well, it's kind of a call, isn't it? Essentially, yeah, uh... exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, that's. <laughs> That's that's perfect. I'd say that I'd say that's yeah. Yeah. Okay, question number 2. What is something related to Star Wars music or sound that you uh want to learn more about? Besides the iconic themes like the Force theme, you know, the ones that that are very or the the main theme I'd be curious which ones recur the most across all the films. Like, or just, just show up like, well, that's interesting. That came back again. Which one comes back the most that isn't one of the main themes? I think you would like this resource called the complete catalog to the musical themes of star Wars. It's the one I've already mentioned um, once on this episode where basically Frank Lehman has kind of categorize or he kind of lists out all the different themes there's like oh there's like a couple hundred there's like a hundred or so of them um and then at, but at the very end of the of the catalog there's a census a thematic census that tout that number tallies up the a number of times each theme shows up in each oh brilliant film. and so i will tell you in empire strikes back the one that shows up the most is the imperial march but then, of course, you could see what the second most, you know, if you want to filter out some of the more popular ones. I actually don't know off the top of my head what of the less known ones um, show up the most to. So I would be interested in that as well. Like now I'm going to go look it up and <laughs> try to figure that out. Yeah, because, yeah, I guess, tr yeah, filtering out the really obvious ones. <laughs> like, does the droids make the list? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a job with him. The Jawa theme. Yeah. Means the <laughs> yeah. Um, and the final question is, uh, what is a score or soundtrack that you're fond of besides anything Star Wars? I mean, I certainly like most of the John Williams scores. That's an easy reference. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like his score for 1941, which no one, no one seems to talk about. That's a deep cut. Which uh, highly recommend and has one of his best marches. Oh, and John uh, Williams is has done many fantastic marches. So he's but this one for just pure bombast. Much like the film, it it represents the the march from 1941. If you ever get a chance to to experience that and turn it up loud, it is it is a rollicking, fun piece of music. Um. That I'd say Quincy Jones's score for the Italian job mm. is a lot of fun. Uh, I really love, particularly the main suite uh, of Jerry Goldsmith's Gremlins. Oh, score. 
Like when it really gets into the gremlins doing their attack. That's very eighties. But then he brings in like you know like a, a drummer that's just like it just uh, it's just wonderful. So it you know it it feels like a an a, a, it feels like an orchestra with a band. Mm, that's a that's a good description. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's a real fun listen. But that goes to some weird places. It does. That's yeah. That that film goes to weird places as well. I saw it for the first time a few years ago because I went on Gremlins pod. I forgot what the podcast is called, but it was like Gremlins Minute. You know, like a movies by minute podcast. Uh, and I went on it and talked about the score after my first watch of it. So oh. it, as a, I was just <laughs> so like, you were still processing. Yeah, yeah. I was not prepared for what Gremlins had to offer me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that because uh, he arranged the, his various themes into a suite. So just go look up the Gremlins suite. Anyone who's listening who hasn't yeah. heard it, and it is just I'll a real a fun listening. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I mean, so many of the films from the '80s just are lodged in my brain. Stuff like you know, Sylvester's Back to the Future, and mm. uh, you know, the uh, uses a lot of Lydian mode. Of and it it draws you, uh, I guess, into the past and into the future. <laughs> yeah, those are fun films. Uh, I like that the, score. Uh, I'm trying to remember who did the score for the last Starfighter. It has a great main theme. Someone just someone that was someone's pick two episode two episodes ago. Oh, Craig really? Safin. Yeah, I I love that main theme for Last Starfighter. Uh, I had never even heard of that movie until just two episodes ago, and now there's two two people that well, are... you need to find out about Star Command. You need to go watch Last Starfighter now. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> I mean, two uh, of us can't be wrong, right? If we're referencing it. Oh, what uh, are the odds? I'd say I could keep I could keep mentioning. So you, you are know, a fan of film scores, ones. clearly. Oh, yes. Love to love to listen to film scores. So awesome. uh very much uh, embedded in my brain. But I think, you know, that's, I think that's something that happened to my generation because of Star Wars and the Spielberg films. When Mm. those kind of scores made a return, like the importance of an orchestral score made a return to film in the late 70s. Uh, And then, you know, stuck around through the 80s. I think that when they would been phasing out, there's a lot of, minimalism in the seventies prior to that, that we're avoiding using big orchestras. So I think that to be of a generation that was super young and watching these things, it made an impression to have an orchestra as to where the, we really haven't lost that in the way that the seventies lost evolved. that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think that you, if you really want to make an impression, a lot of films still will turn to, iconic orchestration yeah doesn't mean that it is a certain type of orchestration one way or the other but the fact that there is some kind of musical component that's there that's not just you know songs it's not just a jukebox right score right yeah the evolution of film music is um so fascinating and just star wars played such a big role in in the trend, in that whole thing. I mean, Star Wars actually, I mean, it, it played a big role in like much of film in many departments uh, in paving ways, bringing back trends, like even just bringing back the 20th Century Fox fanfare. I mean, yeah. I mean, literally stating from the beginning, hey, orchestras are back. (laughs) Seriously, that's what Star Wars does. (laughs) Yeah. Here's your wake up call. This is what this is going to be. This is yeah. a fanfare for bringing all this back. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy for it. Um, where can people find you online, Ken? And your also, I th- uh, your Muppet thread and everything. Is it all one long thread? It's all one long thread. Okay, yeah. I put a direct link to it on my link tree. Perfect. I'll put a link to it. Which is probably the easiest place to send people now. So yeah. So it's just linktr.ee slash Ken Plume. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. uh, I'll have it's probably look. the easiest way to find Instagram and website and all that stuff, all the socials. Awesome. Now, and you have a podcast of your own? I have a few. Uh, I have a bit of a chat, which is one I've done for many, many years, which is just talking with 
interesting people about things. So that's five or six hundred episodes of that. Oh my gosh. Just, uh, yeah, there's a few out there. <laughs> um, uh, I do a show called Force Five for the past year, which has been a fun little lark of having guests on to pick their top five Star Wars figures and collectibles. Oh, and we just I see have you have some in the background. There's a few. There's a few things back there. Yeah. Uh, so that's been fun. That's had some some nice, wonderful guests on. Um, and I wrote a book, a new book that's out, uh, The Art of DuckTales, which people can pick up, which is the making of the, the 2017 DuckTales series. Oh. Big, nice, uh, hardcover collector's book. So, uh, cool. yeah, all those things. Very cool. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I oh, you, you, you were the me. person I wanted to talk to for these minutes. Uh, well, I hope I fulfilled your expectations. <laughs> you did. Of what you you really this did. Would be. You did, uh, and I'm feeling very inspired about about it all. <laughs> I can even do a sound clip. I, one of one of the most disturbing uh, things ever released, which was the Yoda mask. Have you seen <gasps> oh this? my god, <laughs> that's really scary. But it also does this. <laughs> <laughs> So it has, an, for listeners, it has an articulated that is so mouth. Distur- it looks so disturbing, though. Uh, it's even more disturbing when it's worn, uh, which I'll just. Oh, God, the eyes. The eyes. Yeah. No, there's no good way to wear this thing that oh. makes it in any way accept- acceptable. But. <laughs> oh, my God. So this thing, that could be hanging on your wall right now behind you. So it's much better. It could you be have so, everyone who yeah. was complaining about. It could be so much worse. Backpack. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that, well, thank you well, for I that. Well, I just made I'm a have nightmares now. Okay. <laughs> you don't own it. You're safe. <laughs> it's true. All right. Well, um, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> Let me know if you have any questions. Um, if you have follow-up questions about anything Ken talked about, perhaps you, if you let me know, I can pass them on. Um, and thanks for the listeners who did submit questions. Um, if you want to join my Discord server, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, and I think, I think, I think that's a that's a creepy but good way to end. Um, <laughs> may the force oh, be with you, everyone. And. Talk to you next week on Star Wars Music Minute. (laughs)